Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Give everyone a second to find their seats. Good afternoon. So to start off, uh, the City of London is committed to making every effort to provide alternate formats and communication supports to, for council standing or advisory committee meetings and information upon request. Uh, to make a request for any city services, please contact accessibility at london.ca or 519-661-2489, extension 2425. Uh, further, if you require any support uh, for this meeting, please uh, identify yourself to one of our staff. Uh, the seats up on the top end of the gallery there, uh, should uh, someone present that uh, requires them, please make sure that they're available. With that, I would look to committee to see if there's any items of pecuniary interest. Seeing none, I will move to consent. Uh, anybody wish to bring any items from consent? Okay, seeing none, I will take a motion uh, to pass the consents. Moved by Councillor Hopkins, seconded by Councillor Helmer. Any discussion? Councillor Helmer. I just want to say on item 2.1, the uh, affordable housing strategy, I, I think that's would be really helpful a report. I think it's the next uh, step on the road. To, uh, obviously, a lot of things underway uh, related to this, and I think some way of integrating it together is going to be really helpful. Thank you. Any further comments? Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, I just want to uh, say thank you to staff for the uh, the um, 2.1, the affordable housing, the report coming forward. I'm really pleased to see this, and I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, the draft uh, housing strategy that will be coming to us, I guess, in 2019. So thanks again for the work. It's really, really important to have this. Anything further? Uh, from my perspective as well, 2.1 certainly uh, garnered a lot of interest from the community uh, and the media as well. Uh, so it shows uh, how important that is within our community. Uh, I think uh, this uh, will be uh, something that we really need to embark upon uh, and that uh, the next term of council will uh, need to quickly address. Uh, the, uh, the tools that are identified and how we can uh, access those uh, are well identified within the report. Uh, I did have a question. Um, one thing I, I have discussed kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one with a couple uh, members of the administration uh, was with respect to condo conversions. Um, and uh, I, I know I had sent to some, some articles that talked about how the uh, city of Hamilton, for example, had uh, creates a bit of a moratorium where uh, vacancies, uh, vacancy rates in, uh, in rental housing drops below uh, two percent. At that point, they uh, they do some moratoriums on uh, on condo conversions. Uh, I was wondering if if that might be something we might be able to explore as well as one of these. Uh, Mr. Chair, we're glad to do that uh, to include that consideration, whether it's moratorium or criteria or whatever the case may be, and just see how that might fit uh, within the context of this overall consideration for. Uh, affordable housing development. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, certainly, as uh, as that occurs, it uh, tends to remove stock of housing that may be affordable at some point, and uh, uh, removes it from the inventory and increases that uh, that pressure on on the vacancy rates. Okay. So, uh, any further comments, questions? Seeing none, uh, we have it moved and seconded. I'll open the vote to pass the consents. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Okay, next up is uh, item 3.1, which is a delegation from Mr. Levin, the chair of the, uh, and Ms. Hall uh, from the Environmental and Ecological Planning Advisory Committee. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and congratulations to the members of council here who were reelected last week. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Susan Hall and Andrea Boyer, also members of EPAC. Uh, both will speak a little bit about our recommendation that's before you, but I want to speak to that at the end. Uh, Ms. Hall was more involved with the development of this uh, brochure, and uh, Ms. Boyer is a PhD candidate at the Advanced Facility for Avian Research at Western, where the document was shared as well. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Hall and then Ms. Boyer, and then I'll come back and ask you what to do with this. 
Thank you. Um, EPAC has been working on the what we call affectionately as the CAT brochure for about a year and a half now. And the intent of the brochure was both to keep cats and birds safe. And um, as the brochure points out, there's a lot of, uh, of, of bird, uh, birds, a lot of birds are killed related to roaming cats, um, both um, probably both inside the yard and outside the, the yard. And we recognize that there's a City of London bylaw which states that cat owners need to keep their cats their, their cats in, not inside but confined to their yard. So part of the brochure has been focused on, on what keeps um, cats safe, how they can be happy inside and what um, cat owners can provide and what some of the dangers are outside. And um, when cats are kept in their yard or kept safe um, indoors, then, then birds are safer um, out of birds are safer in their natural environment. And the brochure also points out um, bird kill related um, to cats. Um, as part of this process, we presented the brochure at the Animal Welts, Animal Right, Animal um, AWAC and um, incorporated their, their suggestions. They were quite enthusiastic about the brochure and, and were eager to use it when it was produced. Also, it's a fairly timely issue. Last week on TVO, I was listening to the agenda and they, they were talking about species at risk and ways of protecting species at risk. And one of the cheaper ways of, 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 of protecting species at risk birds was identified as keeping cats indoors. So, so thank you. So I'm Andrea Boyer, and just to reiterate, I'm a PhD candidate at Western, specifically under the Advanced Facility for Avian Research. Uh, and this brochure was shared with uh, senior faculty, staff, and students at AFAR, Advanced Facility for Avian Research. Uh, and just to kind of reiterate that there was a very positive response um, from the output of this brochure, specifically um, our director and uh, senior faculty members uh, were very pleased with how this outcome uh, of the brochure uh, ended up. Um, so I'm really just reiterating um, the strong support from the avian research uh, community uh, supporting the fact that it's really important to uh, encourage residents to keep uh, cats specifically uh, within the yard uh, to kind of preserve those declining um, bird population numbers. Thank you. Mr. Chair, so what, uh, over the last couple of days, I've had an email interchange with Ms. Heather Chapman from your municipal bylaw enforcement. And her suggestion was to replace the two recommendations that are coming before you uh, from EPAC with a request that it be referred to her area for implementation. Uh, basically, she reminded me that the uh, licensing goes to both cat and dog owners, and therefore more than half of uh, any mailings of this with licensing would be wasted. And she also uh, wanted to get a little more information about some of the references, but that's very minor things. Your communication people have already reviewed this for readability and accessibility. So from uh, our perspective, from working behind the scenes with your staff, and I see Mr. Kosovis nodding, um, I, I would be really pleased if this committee would uh, take action on uh, Ms. Chapman's uh, recommendation to refer it to that area for implementation. Thank you all, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I would look, I think, to Mr. Kostopis, and uh, it seems like you, you have your accord uh, with the recommendation there. Uh, the one before us is 5.3 on the EPAC report. Uh, clause A is uh, that the um, that the poster be produced, uh, and that uh, clause B is that uh, the brochure is produced and mailed. As, so we would look to sweet, uh, to change that clause uh, on B. Uh, through the chair, I understand that both clauses would be replaced with a referral uh, to staff, and then we would uh, look to implement um, these these two components. And I've looked to the clerk, and it looks like uh, we have that ready to go. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the committee? 
Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, thank you for this. It's um, great to have this brochure. I think it's go it's valuable information for uh, the public to have. And uh, I uh, was just wondering when the brochure was being made up, did you look at feral cats at all? I know that tends to be a concern out in rural areas in particular, but uh, I, I, I guess uh, what is the best way to, to deal with feral cats or... Um, would it go through bylaw enforcement or not exactly sure what the process would be? Cats and and the focus on on the brochure is not feral cats. It's it's cat owners um, But in terms of feral cats when we were at AWAC, there was quite a discussion on that issue and um, some feral cats apparently are trapped um, I know also that um, animal organizations, cat organizations, will foster feral cats um, and, and help them go through a transition where they're more comfortable with people and don't wander as much. But the focus is not, we, we did discuss it and it was too wide of a focus to include that in the brochure. Okay. Uh, thank you. And, and maybe uh, for you, Mr. Chair, if, if I can go to staff, if, if we can just understand the process, if there is a feral cat in the, someone's backyard, what is the process? Uh, through the chair, we do have a, like a trap neuter release program with, with ferals, and we do uh, capture them if they're healthy. We will actually neuter, spay, and, and then release them back into a colony. Uh, we also have a feral cat colony even at the Cat Adoption Centre, the Caddy Shack. Uh, in the barn that uh, we house and uh, provide them shelter as well. Uh, thank you. And I guess uh, uh, getting back to the recommendation that we is before us, will it go to bylaw enforcement or what is the uh, process here? Uh, through the chair, yes, it'll go through our bylaw enforcement team. So that's through Horace Katolik and uh, Heather Chapman is the, uh, uh, the manager responsible for the animal welfare program. Any further questions or discussion? Okay. Seeing none, uh, the uh, the revision is uh, now that uh, the proposed brochure be referred to civic administration for implementation. All right, I'll take a motion. To receive the report and make the recommendation. Moved by Councillor Hopkins, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Thank you for coming. Uh, the next item uh, to be heard is uh, application for 1331 Hyde Park Road. Uh, this is a public participation meeting. Item 3.2 looks to the committee to open the public participation meeting. Moved by Councillor Cassidy and second by Councillor Helmer. And we'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Okay, and welcome Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I begin, I do just want to recognize Michelle Kneerum, who did all the heavy lifting on this application. As we speak, she's participating in an LPAT hearing and couldn't be here, uh, so I am pinch hitting for her, but this is all her work. So the application is at, uh, as you see here, 1331 Hyde Park Road. It's right at the uh, base of the, what we know as a Hyde Park Road uh, Main Street commercial corridor. Uh, the site is uh, 62 meters of frontage and 90 meters of depth. And it, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's just abutting the swim pond. Just surrounding land uses are uh, sites that look like they will be redeveloped in the future or already underway. There's a couple of vacant development sites. And to the rear is a subdivision proposed to be built for townhouses. So it's certainly a developing area. And the subject site is currently vacant. Under the official plan, the site is a uh, Main Street commercial corridor. And similarly, with the London plan, it, it carries over that same uh, planned vision. And under the, the existing zoning, it is a business district two zone, which again it, uh, implements the London plan place type and the official plan designation. 
The images that you see on the right of your screen are the proposed built form. I should note that these are proceeding through a site plan process, so the built form wasn't part of the zoning amendment application. Uh, but the build form is consistent with what we would expect to see in a business district commercial main uh, uh, place type. Uh, the official plan amendment being requested is essentially an official plan amendment to the 1989 official plan to bring it up to speed and consistent with the, the London plan. The reason for that is because uh, the London plan would permit this kind of use already and yet we just want to make the 89 official plan consistent. The zoning bylaw amendment wants to maintain the uh, business district commercial zone, but add the use of an automobile sales uh, boutique and allow for service of the automobile. And when I say automobile, it should be noted that the requested use is actually going to be for motorcycles. But under the zoning bylaw, it's, it's a vehicle um, under that definition. And, uh, and also add um, a maximum, right now the subject site doesn't have a maximum front yard depth. So theoretically this building could be pushed to the back of the site. And so uh, the request is to maintain that existing permission. Should be noted too that no outdoor display is being proposed or permitted. It's all entirely enclosed within the building. So just to give you a sense of what an automobile sales boutique is, it's an existing use in the current zoning bylaw, and it's an enclosed retail store where vehicles are displayed in a showroom internal to the premises for the purpose of sale, hire, or lease, but shall not include the outdoor display uh, or storage of vehicles or the repair and service of vehicles. So that last point, the repair and service, is something I'm going to touch upon. And again, uh, under the zoning bylaw, a motorcycle is a vehicle subject to this definition. So a couple of issues we considered. Uh, is the use appropriate? So first of all, as mentioned, this use is not contemplated in the 89 official plan, but it would be permitted in the London plan place type as the London plan is more general when it comes to retail sales. Uh, and so the amendment to the official plan, 89 official plan, is to bring it up to speed with the London plan. The second uh, issue that we considered is whether or not service and repair of vehicles is appropriate for the site. As you saw by that definition, it, it wouldn't be permitted. But that definition uh, truly was vehicle, uh, like automobile repair. And in this case, the use is going to be very limited, 50 square meters, and it's going to be entirely enclosed within the building. And so with those two restrictions, we felt it's appropriate to consider a small uh, repair as long as it's interior and cap to within the 50 square meters. The third issue we considered was the form. And as mentioned, the current zoning uh, pro, or doesn't have a maximum depth, so this building could be set back. And the requested amendment was to maintain that in the, in the uh, zoning bylaw. However, uh, as, as part of the recommended zoning, we disagreed with that and believe that a maximum front yard depth should be established consistent with what you would find in, in the standard business district commercial zoning. And um, also recognizing the fact that there is a, an existing building being processed through site plan, which proposes to locate it exactly where it should be within the first three meters of the subject site. So it won't prohibit that building from being constructed. And then the last issue is height. And the reason this was an issue we considered is because in the Main Street place type, the London plan would uh, require a minimum height of two stories or eight meters. The subject site is being processed under site plan is, <clears throat> excuse me, it's for a one-story building that's 5.8 meters in height. So it is shorter than what the London plan would uh, permit. But again, that uh, site plan is being processed under the existing zoning and wasn't subject to this amendment. Uh, it's worth noting that there were no interested parties, uh, public concerns with regard to this application. And so the recommended zoning is to permit the requested use and allow the service and repair of the vehicles, and in, again, in this case, motorcycles, limited to 50 square meters and fully enclosed, uh, and to not recommend uh, that the existing um, front yard setback which has no limits be maintained. So uh, put the other way, we are recommending that a maximum front yard setback be included. And again, the request of the London plan is to just bring it up to speed with the current, uh, the London plan policies that would permit this kind of use. And that's just what it looks like in technical terms. Um, and that's my presentation, Mr. Chair.
Thank you, Mr. Thomas Sensick. We'll look to the committee. Any questions of a technical nature? Uh, thank you. This um, <clears throat> question to staff. Just south of this property seems to be an access to a gravel pit. Is that? Is there a? Is, con is there contemplated a, 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 a roadway into the proposed subdivision just south of this, or or not? Mr. Chair, I just want to confirm that, that uh, we're talking about the Hyde Park application and not Crestwood, because that that one might be more. Uh, uh, it seems like that that question relates to that one. Okay, well, I'll have to look at that one to see if it's the case. But um, no, this is the one right at right at Hyde Park and the and the train tracks. It seems just between this property and the the stormwater management management pond is uh, is a little roadway. That goes into what? Well, I guess maybe it's not a gravel pit. It's it's probably the. I'm I'm looking at Google Maps, which s seems to be, um, you know, um, something looks like something dug up here, right? So, um, is there? Do we plan to see a road access just uh, south of South Carriage Road um, and south of the property, north of the tracks? Uh, Mr. Chair, we'll confirm that in, in a moment, if we could just have some time just to review. But I believe it's just an access. If anything, it's an access to the swim pond, but we'll confirm that. Thank you. I think, uh, oh, Councillor Morgan. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not staff, but I have been out in that area. There is a pathway uh, adjacent to the stormwater management pond that is a walking path that connects to the path across the road to the south. I think that that is what is referred to on the map uh, behind uh, it looks like a gravel pit because there's a subdivision being constructed and it's currently under construction. Any further questions? Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Uh, just a quick question uh, uh, to Mr. Tom Sensick. The, uh, uh, the zoning that would be allowed here then would uh, carry further. So the, the uh, parts about the automotive repair, specifically for the motorcycles, limited to that, that floor plate. Uh, is there any opportunity then later should the usage change to uh, to expand that or is it is it in kind of in perpetuum that, uh, that it's somewhat restricted in its size uh, mr. chair as part of the zoning amendment we included that 50 square meters as part of the amendment okay thanks no further questions uh, is there a representative from the applicant here welcome Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. You probably know my name, Laverne Kirkness from Kirkness Consulting, and I'm representing 1331 Hyde Park, Inc. Uh, one of the principals is with me, Mark Minnie. I would ask him to stand so that you know who, what he looks like. He's actually the motorcycle dealer, both uh, BMW and Indian. Now, um, you see the L-shaped building there, and the central part is, uh, that building is about 16,000 square feet. Uh, 8,000 would be uh, this motorcycle uh, retail store, uh, basically, and the so out of out of eight <clears throat> out of eight thousand square feet, about five hundred would be for this service. It's it, five hundred square feet. It's almost uh, accessory, incidental, subordinate. Um, uh, but in but in fact, the plan division and their thoroughness of, of course uh, kind of provided uh, it to be permitted especially when the definition says you can't. So, uh, so that's the right thing to do. And um, we, we do uh, thank staff for their support, and we hope that you would uh, take it on to council and uh, uh, adopt what they're recommending, uh, which is basically adding this automobile sales boutique to, uh, to the permitted uses. <clears throat> I, think, I think there was a Fiat dealer in the Hyde Park uh, shopping uh, a few years ago, and I'm not sure it's still there, uh, near uh, that large furniture store at Hyde Park and Fanshawe, and maybe that's where it started up. But, but in fact, this is a whole new way of retailing motorcycles. There's very little service. As I say, 500 square feet out of 8,000 square feet. So uh, what's that, uh, one uh, tenth or so, one uh, thirteenth? Um, we... Um, know that uh, the, there are other partners in this. Uh, you might know the Abruzzi restaurant downtown. Uh, those uh, partners would be 
uh, using 4,000 square feet here for another uh, restaurant uh, of a similar line. And uh, there's also an office tenant as well. But uh, in terms of uh, trying to fulfill the objectives of the main street of Hyde Park, uh, and we're at the, as Michael said, the base of it, uh, we think that with the building design up to the street uh, and up against the multi-use uh, pathway as well to the south that goes, that takes you into the open space area at the back with I think a stormwater management facility called 1B1, um, uh, this building will contribute what it has to uh, uh, making Hyde Park a nice street to walk along and to look in windows and that sort of thing. So we think we've met those objectives and uh, we again appreciate the planning staff support. We would ask if there was any, uh, there hasn't been any public response, but if there is some, we'd like the opportunity to respond if it's relevant. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kirkness. Any questions for the applicant? Seeing none at this point, uh, I would look to the community. We have four microphones, so waiting your delegations. Anybody wish to speak to this matter? I'll make a second call. And one third call. Seeing no delegations, I would look to the committee to close the public participation meeting. Moved by Councillor Hopkins, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Thank you. I look to my colleagues. Any comments? Councilor Morgan. Um, yes, I know that there was no comments on the public liaison, but I can tell you that uh, it was discussed in the community, both um, by some members of the Hyde Park uh, Business Association, and this certainly would fall within the boundaries of the Hyde Park uh, BIA. Uh, and uh, I, the comments that I heard was that it, it seems like a very appropriate development. Um, the provisions the staff put in place to, to front it onto the street, to limit the square footage and ensure that it was contained within doors, as well as the applicant's uh, plans to put a, a restaurant in, I think is very smart. There's a, a lot of walkability to that location from the new subdivision coming behind, as well as some uh, high density um, that's being put in and already existing to the north. And I think that this will be uh, quite a successful development. And so um, certainly nothing negative that I think Mr. Kirkness will want to respond to. All, all positives from the conversations that I had about this, both within the BIA as, as well as with members uh, in the adjacent community. And further comments? Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, just a couple questions. Um, I'm not sure to who, but uh, Upper Thames, I know there's a request to have Section 28. Is that automatic with this approval, or does the applicant have to, is it the applicant's responsibility? I'm just reading in the report, and I'm just a little unclear as to um, Section 28 permit requirements, which may be required for the proposed development. If you could just explain a little bit more that process. Uh, it's uh, part of the site's in a regulated area of Upper Thames, so that re triggers the need for a Section 28 permit, of which we have already applied for and, and got as part of the site plan approval. Thank you for that clarification. And the other question I had, does, does this, I, I know it's an auto sales boutique, and just to understand what we are um, allowing here, I know it's going to be a motorcycle area, or it will be uh, strictly motorcycles, but I would assume cars could also be part of this boutique, and would trucks be allowed as well? No, no, it's exclusively motorcycles. Thank you for that clarification. Further comments or questions? Oh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I should just uh, have a quick look at the zoning bylaw, though, just to see how the term vehicle is defined. Um, although this use is motorcycles, the definition could allow uh, vehicle or trucks to come in. If I could just have a moment to look at the definition. Thank you.
Mr. Chair, the, uh, the definition for vehicle is pretty broad and, and would include uh, trucks as well. So I just want to be upfront about that. Notwithstanding that, the regulations would continue to apply, including the indoor nature of it, no outdoor storage, uh, and the, the limited square footage of any repair. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, I'd look to the committee for uh, moving a recommendation. Councilor Helmer, staff recommendation, I'd imagine. Councilor Cassidy seconds. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Hey, thank you. That moves us along to item 3.2, uh, sorry, 3.3, .3, public participation meeting. The application at 537 Crestwood Drive. I'll look to the committee to open the public participation meeting. Moved by Councillor Helmer, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. I'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Okay, thank you, welcome Ms. Campbell. The floor is yours. Just waiting for the presentation to come up. Great. This is a rezoning application for 537 Crestwood Drive. Crestwood Drive extends from Commissioner's Road West to Longwoods Road in the vicinity of the Byron Gravel Pits. The subject lands, as I mentioned earlier, are municipally known as 537 Crestwood Drive, and the subject lands are located on the west side of Crestwood Drive, adjacent to aggregate resource areas west of the subject lands. Uh, the surrounding land uses include aggregate resource extraction areas and operations, the city's water reservoir, and existing low-density, low-rise residential. Uh, the realignment of Commissioner's Road West is planned within uh, the proximity of the subject lands. Uh, the subject site is approximately uh, 4,188 square meters, or approximately one acre in size. Uh, the subject lands consist of a flag-shaped lot with a narrow street frontage along Crestwood Drive. There are existing uh, two single-family detached dwellings uh, on the uh, property, uh, and they were... Um, uh, um, approved through a prior uh, development and planning application 2012-2013. The requested amendment is for a rezoning from the Urban Reserve 1 zone and Residential R3 Special Provision 13 zone for the westerly portion of the subject lands to a Residential R6 Special Provision zone to permit cluster housing in the form of single attached dwellings and specifically to permit the development of a third dwelling unit on the westerly portion of the site. The uh, requested special provisions would recognize existing site conditions, uh, which include a reduced minimum lot frontage of 10 meters along Crestwood Drive, a reduced easterly minimum side yard depth of 1.5 meters, a reduced southerly minimum rear yard depth for an accessory building of 1.2 meters, and increased maximum height for an accessory building of 7 meters. The requested special provisions would also recognize new site conditions, and this relates to the addition of the third dwelling unit. Uh, would which would include a reduced minimum rear yard depth of four meters, an increased minimum landscape open space of 42%, and a reduced southerly minimum side yard depth for an accessory building of 1.5 meters, um, which was previously not recognized. Uh, a subsequent application for site plan approval and a plan of vacant land condominium would be required to implement the development of the third dwelling unit. Uh, this is an image of the... Um, development proposal showing the addition of the third unit highlighted in yellow. In terms of the planning history, as I mentioned earlier, in 2012, there was an official plan amendment, zoning bylaw amendment, and plan of vacant land condominium by the current applicant, Star Homes Limited, to permit cluster housing and the development of three single attached dwellings. At that time, council approved the request to change the designation of the whole of the subject lands. Um, 
and approve the request to change the zoning for the easterly portion of the subject lands withholding provision consistent with the staff recommendation. In 2012, council refused the request to change the zoning for the westerly portion of the subject lands consistent with the staff recommendation. Uh, the staff's reason for the refusal at that time were that the applicant had not demonstrated the separation distance for the westerly portion of the subject lands was satisfactory to protect residential development from the adverse impacts of the adjacent existing aggregate resource extraction activities. Uh, also, the westerly portion of the subject lands should be precluded from development prior uh, to provide a buffer between the adjacent aggregate resource extraction activities and the proposed residential development on the easterly portion of the subject lands. And thirdly, that the development should not occur on the westerly portion of the subject lands until a rehabilitation plan was completed for adjacent aggregate resource extraction areas and the site restoration had been completed in accordance with the plan. There was a 2013 removal of a holding provision um, to remove the holding provisions that apply to the easterly portion of the subject lands and council subsequently approved the removal of those holding provisions. Uh, the mm -hmm. holding provisions dealt with noise impacts and geotechnical studies. From a policy um, framework, the 2014 PPS, or Provincial Policy Statement, directs that planning authorities shall provide for an appropriate range and mix of housing types and densities to meet requirements for current and future residents. New housing is to be located where there are appropriate levels of infrastructure and public service facilities. Uh, new housing should be at densities which efficiently use resources, infrastructure, and public service facilities. Um, going on, major facilities such as aggregate resource extraction um, activities and sense of land uses should be designed, buffered, and separated from each other to prevent adverse impacts and to ensure the long-term viability of the major facilities. Uh, mineral aggregate resource um, should be protected from incompatible developments that could hinder or their continued use of the resource or expansion of the extraction activities. Uh, so consistent with the settlement and housing policies in the PPS, the requested amendment would provide for a range and mix of housing types and densities. Um, it would provide for new housing at a density that would provide for efficient land use, infrastructure and public service um, facilities, as well as support active transportation and transit. However, the requested amendment and proposed development is not consistent with the PPS regarding the mineral aggregate resources. Um, in terms of the 1989 official plan, the uh, whole of the property is currently designated low density residential. In the London plan, the property is in the neighborhood's place type with frontage on a neighborhood street. And as mentioned earlier, the um, lands are currently uh, zoned uh, residential R6 with a special provision to prevent cluster housing in the form of single thatched dwellings on the easterly portion of the site. And on the westerly portion, the lands are currently in the urban reserve one zone. Uh, the requested amendment to permit cluster housing on the westerly portion of the uh, subject lands, um, in particular a single attached dwelling one story in height conforms to the range of, of primary permitted uses and the intensity of development contemplated in the low density residential designation and in the neighborhood's place type. However, there are also um, policies for specific residential areas, specific to lands in the vicinity of the Byron gravel pits that would apply here. Uh, those policies speak to um, prior to rezoning within 300 meters of an extractive resource area or aggregate um, industry, a noise and dust impact study shall be completed. Residential subdivisions shall be phased to maintain maximum separation distance between residential development and extraction oper um, operations. A minimum separation distance of 150 meters should be provided between residential development and the limit of extraction. And any deviation from this minimum separation distance, that's the 150 meters, should be on the basis of studies which demonstrate the deviation is satisfactory to protect the residential development from adverse impacts. Uh, these policies have been carried forward into the London plan and are found under the environmental policies, natural resources, specific policies for aggregate resources um, that relate to the Byron gravel pits and adjacent lands. <coughs> There are currently um, active um, aggregate licenses um, on the properties um, adjacent to the subject lands. Um, that is shown on the left-hand side of the screen. <clears throat> um, 
In May 2018, uh, email correspondence was provided to the applicant's agent prior to accepting the application, indicating um, that the studies provided in support of the application did not conclusively demonstrate to staff that the proposed residential development could meet the minimum separation distance uh, required between um, the limit of extraction and um, uh, the new residential development. A 2000 July 2018 letter correspondence from Lafarge confirmed to staff that um, aggregate resource extraction could occur up to 15 meters from the shared property boundary with the subject lands. This was previously disclosed through the 2012 planning and development application. Uh, so it should be known to the applicant. Uh, July 2018, uh, email correspondence was provided to the applicant's agent requesting confirmation <clears throat> that the pro's residential development could be appropriately protected from potential impacts and hazards associated with the aggregate resource extraction activities. Um, staff um, ultimately had to rely on previous studies that were submitted as part of the 2012 application. Uh, no new studies were provided as part of the current application. Um, just to highlight um, some things from the previous studies, in terms of the 2011 noise and vibration impact analysis, um, RWDI, who was the um, consultant who prepared it, predicted no adverse, ad, no adverse noise impacts based on previous studies in the uh, Byron gravel pits, um, which had demonstrated uh, noise compliance at locations closer to the aggregate resource extraction activities in the subject lands. RWDI therefore concluded that the subject lands would also be in compliance. As a precaution, RWDI recommended warning clauses registered on title. Uh, in 2012, uh, the uh, 2012 staff report indicated that noise compliance needed to be um, confirmed through site-specific readings. Um, RD RWDI subsequently submitted in support of the, the 2013 holding removal application um, a more specific um, noise study that dealt with the two easterly um, uh, pro, um, dwellings. <clears throat> Uh, our WDI also noted in their 2011 noise and vibration impact study that uh, during restoration of aggregate resource extraction areas that extensive earth moving activities would take place uh, near to uh, grade, more so than actually when the aggregate resource extraction activities are taking place. Uh, so noise impact remains a concern for staff. Uh, there were no specific studies that dealt with the impacts directly for the westerly portion of the subject lands. And um, again, the issue of whether there are noise impacts as a result of restoration um, has not been dealt with in detail. Uh, in 2011, a dust impact analysis was also prepared by RWDI. It concluded that periodic occurrences of dust impacts would be moderate to high, similar to other experience of nearby existing residential properties. RWDI recommended warning clauses uh, registered on title that was supported by staff. Um, in 2011, there was also a stable slope analysis by EXP. Uh, EXP delineated an erosion hazard limit slightly inside the westerly rear property limit of the subject lands. Uh, 2000 Staff, the 2012 staff report cannot support the third dwelling unit because of the erosion hazard limit. The 2012 staff report recommended the westerly portion of the subject lands be precluded from development to ensure sufficient land was adjacent to the steep slope hazard to accommodate final restoration and development only be considered after the rehabilitation plan and restoration activities have been finalized. So key issues um, in terms of land use compatibility, Residential development on the subject land uh, does not meet the minimum separation distance required between residential development and the limit of extraction. Past studies did not address whether the residential development of the third dwelling unit would be appropriate and protected from adverse impacts or hazards, and no new studies have been submitted to support the current application. The requested amendment would remove the westerly portion of the subject lands as a buffer between adjacent aggregate resource extraction activities and the existing residential development on the easterly portion of the subject lands. And as I mentioned earlier, earlier, this was uh, previously recommended by staff that these land be held as a buffer <clears throat> to ensure land use compatibility. Uh, the aggregate site restoration and rehabilitation also have the potential to cause adverse impacts or hazards, as Matt mentioned in past studies, but not explored in detail by those past studies. Other issues that have uh, risen 
whether a holding provision could be used. Um, staff can have concerns with the uh, requestment, requested amendment proceeding with holding provisions. The reasons for that are the requested amendment would establish permitted land uses while holding provisions would uh, still be addressing land use compatibility and the appropriateness of those land uses. Typically holding provisions are used to address uh, development limits or to ensure that the mitigating <coughs> measures are in fact implemented through um, you know, development agreements or subsequent approvals. But in this case, the holding provisions would actually be still requiring the studies to be completed that would determine whether the land use would be appropriate. Um, <clears throat> the holding provisions for studies to address land use compatibility are not in keeping with the spirit and intent of the specific policies. As mentioned earlier, those specific policies explicitly require any deviation from the minimum separation distance to be on the basis of studies. Um, in the absence of the supporting studies, the requested amendment does not conform to the specific policies of the 1989 official plan, nor the London plan regarding development of land within the vicinity of the Byron gravel pits. Uh, so staff are recommending refusal of the requested amendments at this time. It's not consistent with the 2014 provincial policy statement, which requires mineral aggregate resources be protected for long-term use um, and not hindered by incompatible development. And also that resource extraction activities and sensitive residential development be appropriately separated from one another. As I mentioned, it does not conform to the 1989 official plan, nor the London plan, which specifically requires a minimum separation distance between residential development and the limit of extraction. And the applicant has not demonstrated that a reduction in that um, separation distance can be achieved um, in a manner which would provide for um, adverse impacts and hazards to um, be appropriately addressed. Um, it is also premature in that the uh, urban reserve UR zone should remain till site restoration um, can occur and the rehabilitation plan has been completed for the adjacent aggregate resource extraction area. Thank you. Look to the committee for any questions of a technical nature. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, I forgot to mention, um, and because I, I gave them to Heather earlier, there was a late correspondence received uh, Sunday, and I just wanted to make sure that the planning committee was aware of that correspondence, and it was distributed earlier, so you should have it in your package. There are two communications, one from uh, Mr. Cornell and Ms. Ensley, and second from Mr. McGuffin from right, uh, and, Monteith Brown. And, and I'm speaking directly to the one um, that was provided to, uh, by Mr. Cornell. So I did speak with him this afternoon and we had a conversation about his questions and so we have addressed his questions, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, planning committee was aware of that correspondence. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Uh, to the committee, any questions of technical nature? Okay, I have a quick one. Um, with respect to holding provisions, uh, so the, the land is, is designated as urban reserve, which would then contemplate development at some point. Uh, and if, if held as a reserve, otherwise, uh, it, it needs to be evaluated at some point, I think, is, is what the urban reserve piece is. But it would say that it would be, at some point, site suitable for residential development or some form of development once the remediation activities had occurred at the, at the aggregate site. Um, the, the holding provisions, it's, uh, you talked to Ms. Campbell about uh, them not being suitable at this point, um, and that changes would need to be on the basis of studies uh, in order to grant exemption from those uh, separation distances. I think we, we have used uh, holding provisions in the past where, uh, where minimum distance separations were required. I'm thinking of, uh, of things in, in agricultural MDSs uh, where a holding provision was put in place uh, and that holding provision removal was contingent upon the MDS uh, uh, no longer being a factor in, in the development. This would have been along um, uh, near Woodhall Road, uh, Woodhall Hall or West Elborn, I think, uh, and uh, in the farm uh, piece that we went through a couple times here. Uh, how is that dissimilar? Uh, in this circumstance, does, it, does using an MDS uh, and the, uh, the, the provisions in this case, once those are satisfied, the holding provision can be removed, or once uh, a satisfactory uh, a study showing slope stability is no longer a concern being provided to you, that at that point they would seek uh, removal of the holding provision rather than outright refusal of the application. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe that in that case, the use has been deemed appropriate um, should the MDS issues go away. In this case, I think it gets a little bit more complex because we're talking about the stability of the site and uh, presuming that uh, this site will be able to accommodate the subject 
or the proposed use, and we just don't know that yet, uh, both or in terms of stability and noise and dust, um, and and the limits of the development as well. Perhaps through a rezoning process, the setbacks we put in aren't appropriate, um, and so this will the zoning will create a development envelope that might not be appropriate. So whereas in the previous example, a development envelope was appropriate as soon as MDS issues go away. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, the use of urban reserve for that parcel of land versus, say, environmental review. Uh, and I would think environmental review would consider uh, site hazards uh, versus urban reserve, which would contemplate at some point that gets converted to uh, to developmentable or developable use. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, about why it's parsed that way? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So the intent for the urban reserve zone is to allow for the uh, comprehensive review of um, the development potential in the future for these lands. Um, sorry. Um, in terms of the um, environmental review, that typically deals with uh, natural features and natural hazards. In this case, the slope stability hazard, which is, is one piece of, of this application, is actually not a, a natural hazard, but one that's created by the, um, the aggregate resource extraction that's happening adjacent to the, um, the land. So in this case, um, the subject lands as well as the lands that are used for aggregate resource extraction are um, <clears throat> um, lands that would be developed through a future comprehensive review through a secondary plan process. And at that time, um, it, it may be um, appropriate to put those lands into um, a zone that would permit development. It could be that these lands would go to um, an open space zone to, to recognize you know, if there are um, hazards associated with it. So uh, the, the issue here is that we really don't have the studies to demonstrate how um, this particular subject lands will interact with the lands adjacent to it and and how to um, uh, mitigate any um, impacts from that aggregate resource extraction activity at, at this point in time. Thank you. Councillor Hopkins. Thank you. I think we're still on technical questions and thank you for your questions because I have a follow-up to that. So we know that the there is the Byron Pitt secondary plan with these lands be taken into account through that process? Um, Mr. Chair, I, I don't believe that to be the case, and I, and I don't think it necessarily has to be the case. The secondary plan for the pits could uh, uh, think about the long-term vision for that site, and then a future site-specific application on this site could uh, think about how it integrates with that once we know the what the future of the lands are. At this point, Lafarge still has a license for that uh, area, and um, there are... Uh, uh, is the word I'm looking for. They're, they're willing to continue to use that license and, and haven't really given us a reason to believe that uh, they're going to give up that license anytime soon, so we have to proceed with it. So that's a long way of saying it, this site doesn't have to be, uh, be part of the secondary plan, but once we know what that secondary plan is, we can start planning for the use of this site on a site-specific basis. Councilor Van Holster. Uh, thank you. My uh, technical question to you, Mr. Chair, is once the the neighboring site is no longer being used uh, for aggregate uh, resources, then those studies are no longer required. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> The uh, site-specific policies that would pertain to, that currently pertain to the subject lands um, may not then apply if there aren't um, active resource extraction areas in proximity to the subject land. So it's, it's really those site-specific policies that direct us to look at the impacts of noise and vibration where there is um, um, a resource extraction area or resource extraction operation in proximity to um, the um, subject lands. However, I'd imagine slope stability would still be an issue. 
through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, slope stability actually came out of the 2012 application. Um, so that was a concern that um, isn't specifically identified by the site-specific policy, but was um, an outcome or an issue of the 2012 um, application that dealt with the easterly uh, portion of the subject lands. Uh, yes, thank you. So that uh, seems to be the, the biggest issue, I think, anyone purchasing this property and if they didn't do it sight unseen they would have a pretty good idea that it might be dusty and noisy just from seeing the gravel pit right beside them but uh, the fact that the slope may be unstable of course that could produce a cracking or problems with the house um, if we were to uh, allow this to to go forward and uh, damage were to be done to the property because of uh, as the instability of the slopes or would we be liable in a way for that decision? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't think we're qualified to answer that question, but perhaps if, if uh, legal can provide an opinion on that, that would probably be more helpful. I don't see legal here right now, so I would imagine that would be a question that we could hold until subsequent time. Okay. Uh, any further questions of a technical nature? Uh, seeing none, uh, I believe there's a representative from the applicant here, Mr. McCuffin, welcome. Do I have to turn this on? There we go. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of uh, committee. Uh, thank you. Jay McGuffin, Vice President, uh, Principal Planner, Monteith Brown Planning Consultants. Um, further to the correspondence that I circulated earlier this afternoon on behalf of the applicant uh, who is here with me uh, this evening, Mr. Sarcevic. Uh, he's the owner of um, uh, the remaining part of the property, and this is the, uh, the lot that which is he's uh, looking to actually construct his retirement dwelling uh, onto. So further to uh, the councillor's last comments, uh, with regard to being aware of uh, the existing situations. Uh, I can assure the committee that uh, Mr. Starcevic is uh, very actively aware of the situation. Um, as mentioned, the request is to rezone the property from Urban Reserve 1 to an R62 special zone. And that's the same zone that applies to the remainder of this particular vacant land condominium. Uh, so that includes all the lands to the east that are included in this proposed three-unit um, condominium development. Uh, as a result of recent conversations with city staff, we've proposed the same two holding provisions that were recently applied to those lands to the east of this particular site, um, being units one and two, and that's the H145 and H146, dealing with the requirements for geotechnical reports, um, and noise studies to be completed to ensure that the uh, site is appropriate for development. Um, uh, what wasn't mentioned was the pre-consultation meeting that was held back in March. We had a pre-consultation meeting with a different planner and um, kudos to Ms. Campbell. Uh, she has come on to a rather uh, lengthy planning process, so she is uh, fairly new to what has gone on and she has developed a very comprehensive uh, report based on the previous happenings of this development application since it first started in our court in 2010, um, but actually predates that by many years as well. So there's certainly been a lot of work underway and our client has been patiently waiting for um, events that are occurring within that Byron gravel pit to subside to such a point that he's able to proceed. What's important about the March meeting was anecdotally our client had learned or had been told, informed by others, that there had been a sale of the pit, uh, pit lands to a third party, and that as part of uh, secondary plan work that the city was undertaken, that pit operations were ceasing. In attempts to uh, clarify that and, and get uh, commentary, I contacted um, representatives from Lafarge. Uh, my first point of contact was a representative from the actual pit, and I was informed that what was occurring on the site had in fact started to ramp, um, ramp down and that activities had proceeded away from the subject lands. But in terms of an official report, I would have to speak to somebody higher up. Um, we did have conversations via email and telephone with um, 
uh, another gentleman, uh, his last name is escaping me, first name is Luke. Uh, he's the same individual who has made uh, correspondence on behalf of Lafarge uh, to the city and had identified that the only information he could provide me was that the license for the pit includes extraction within 15 meters of the boundary of the license. Of interest to that, um, I've provided some aerial photography that shows various areas around the various pits that are licensed within the Byron Gravel Pit that identify numerous developments that are within 15 meters of the limit of the pit. So clearly there are areas of the pit where development has been permitted historically to occur um, within close proximity to what would be a 15 meter distance from the pit. With regard to our previous studies, the most difficult component was identifying for our noise consultants where the active area of the pit was. This was the area that the noise consultants were looking for in terms of being able to define their acoustic study to understand what the limits of noise exposure would be to effectively provide for recommendations on mitigation. That information has never been made available to us. We've spent since 2010 numerous times trying to get information from Ministry of Natural Resources, Lafarge and city staff to no avail. We've been provided copies of a remediation plan that were prepared uh, as part of the former area plan, which identified the remediation into essentially glass, uh, grassed slopes, a large recreational lake, um, and, and that was it. That's the only documentation that I'm aware of uh, our office receiving based on, on those inquiries. So back in March, we met with uh, planning staff. Uh, it was M Mr. Corby at the time who had carriage of the pre-consultation. And there was no request for us to provide any additional studies other than those that had been prepared for previous applications on the property. Um, so that was, a, that was a positive outcome. We were, act, however, asked to provide mapping of any of the active pit licenses within the area. Uh, that mapping was provided. And it wasn't until sometime in the summer that we were contacted by planning staff to indicate that um, it would be required that we would have to do additional study or that we could contemplate a holding provision. And the purpose the planning study had contacted us was that prior to processing the application, they wanted to give the applicant the opportunity to withdraw the application and save his application fees. Um, given that the applicant is looking at retiring in this location, he was desirous of proceeding on the basis of providing holding provisions similar to the first application round uh, that was approved in 2012. One of the other things of significance that had occurred was when those first decisions were made in 2012, there was a berm that was situated on my client's property at the west end in the location where the proposed dwelling is to occur. That berm was under an easement uh, in favor of Lafarge and that easement expired and several years ago was removed by Lafarge. Presumably any noise attenuation that was provided by that berm was no longer required as part of uh, the activities occurring within the pit because that berm has been removed and is no longer in existence. Uh, that additional information together with the information that uh, Mr. Starcevic had heard through the community uh, led him to believe that there was now opportunity to construct. Um, still, we were not able to get any specific information to undertake any technical studies to support the application at this point because we still don't know where active uh, extraction is occurring. And as a result, what we have requested is we apply the same two holding provisions that were applied to the lands for lots one and two previously to be applied to lots three. The difference now compared to again back in 2011 and 2012 is that when the planning staff were considering the redesignation of the property and the rezoning of the property as a whole, they redesignated the entirety of the subject property into residential. But they only zoned the front two lots for residential, leaving the westerly lot in urban reserve. Our understanding at that time was that was because there was a commissioner's road realignment study that was about to begin and was going to determine whether or not the westerly portion of our client's land was going to be required for part of that realignment. 
So Mr. Starcevic parked his application and waited until the completion of that environmental assessment work was done. You'll see in the reporting that I submitted this afternoon an excerpt from that report that identifies the conclusions from the environmental assessment that illustrates the location of that preferred design solution for the Commissioner's Road realignment and that it doesn't actually affect any of Mr. Starcevic's lands. With that information, we believe that the application of the holding provisions is consistent with the provincial policy statement, does serve to protect the aggregate resource and extraction, does conform to the policies of the official plan and is consistent with the general intent and nature of the zoning bylaw. And we would ask that the application be approved with holding provisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGuffin. Look to the committee for any questions of technical nature for the applicant. Seen none at this point. Uh, I would look to the community. Anybody wishing to speak to this matter? I'll ask a second time. One third time. Seen none. I'll look to the committee to close the public participation meeting. Moved by Councillor Hopkins, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Any further discussion? We'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Okay, thanks. Uh, committee, any discussion? Any questions? Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, I do have a, a, a question. Um, I'm not sure if someone at staff. Um, do we know when the rehabilitation will be finalized? Do we have any understanding? Three, Mr. Chair, I do not know of any specific timing for the uh, rehabilitation. There was a rehabilitation plan that was completed in, I believe it was 2006, um, but whether that would be the final rehabilitation plan, I believe it's an interim plan. Um, as Mr. McGuffin spoke to, it, it primarily looked at um, the extraction area becoming um, a grass slope with a, a man-made lake, but whether through um, the sub upcoming um, secondary plan process, whether that will be the final version of the um, remediation plan. I, I don't know at this point in time, nor do I know the timing. Councilor Hopkins. So through the secondary plan process, we'll be able to determine if the pit is no longer being used. Mr. Chair, the secondary plan is anticipating that, uh, that one day the pits won't be used and then it's planning for the future long-term state of that site. Um, and so it, the question is when, and we just don't know. We, we did ask Lafarge for that information to assist us with this report and they kept their cards close to their chest. Uh, thank you for that. That's good to know because I know there was a conversation in the community that the pit was no longer being used and uh, so uh, we're not sure at this moment what the plans are. Thank you. Further questions, comments? Councillor. I guess my comment is I, 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 I don't really have a problem with uh, it, being, it being built. Somebody would like to have a retirement home. I'd like them to have one too. I guess it's just a matter of is that is that a problem for for us? I'm wondering from through you to staff. Do do we did we see any other problems uh, with with a building being on here? Would it make the development of the 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 future development of the gravel pit lands problematic in any way? Or, or could it? I think that would be my a better question. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe it could, assuming that the gravel uh, operator, uh, exp um, not expropriate, but um, what's the word I'm looking for, excavate up to their, the uh, 15 meters from the property line, it certainly could present noise, dust, vibration issues for uh, any building on the subject site. I think uh, this 
ends up being a challenging file, um, mostly because uh, for a few reasons. One, the proximity of other developments uh, nearby. Uh, I, uh, I'm wondering, I mean, the, the two adjacent properties on the same property lot, or two adjacent units on the same property lot that are currently there, uh, is, is there a material difference in the impacts that those two would be subject to compared to this third. Recognizing that it's close, uh, the one part in this talked about the sl slope stability question, um, but that was uh, in Ms. Campbell's last answer seemed to, to be just part of it. The noise, dust, vibration uh, are all uh, components that would be revisited upon the site remediation uh, as well. So as soon as uh, any any machinery came back in to, to do remediation, uh, those other two units would be subject to those same impacts, I would imagine. At, at, uh, that proximity to the extraction line at 15 meters, uh, there's there's a slope there. Uh, I, in taking a look at in Mr. McGuffin's submission, uh, even just the uh, uh, the demonstration of where the alignment of the of an example of where the commissioner's road realignment would happen, it doesn't look like there's an anticipation of a rehabilitation of the slope that uh, that is adjacent to that property. Uh, it even kind of demonstrates that slope being maintained there uh, without rehabilitation. Um, that's on page two of Mr. McGuffin's submission there. Uh, so I, I guess I'm trying to navigate through this a little bit. Uh, I, I can appreciate where those concerns are from the geotech side and from the, the adverse impact side of things, uh, but also recognizing that, um, that we have identified through, through Urban Reserve as, and have contemplated at some point that there would be further development of this site potentially. Um, and even allowing road alignments in there uh, that uh, that show future development, uh, we can we can do the refusal outright. I, it sounded like the uh, the discussion there was to try and figure out how to to pull back from the application to save the application fees for the applicant in this circumstance. Holding provisions help to accomplish that as well. Outright refusal means that there's another kick at the can uh, once Lafarge surrenders its licenses if and when in the future. Is that correct? Uh, three, Mr. Chair, I'll try and break down uh, what you said into some component parts, um, if you can appreciate that. Um, so I, I think I'll tackle um, the first part dealing with the two existing properties uh, or, or dwellings on the easterly portion of the subject lands. So um, I, I think what is um, unique there is that those two uh, properties were supported by technical studies that demonstrated that it could be developed in a manner that would be um, appropriate given its proximity to the aggregate resource extraction. So, so that application was justified based on technical studies. Um, part of that was that this third dwelling unit or third lot area, the westerly portion of the subject lands, would provide a buffer to those two existing dwelling units, right? So that um, Wesley portion of the lands is, is providing a, a buffer function, right? Um, so we are relying on um, the recommendations in part from 2012 that identified the need for this, this buffer between um, development. Um, if I could take you to uh, Mr. McGuffin's correspondence and specifically on um, the second to last page where there's an aerial there and, and it's showing um, some adjacent development that's proximate to the pits. Um, I was able to do a little bit of research this afternoon with regards to those particular applications. And, and things that I would note, um, the uh, four houses that are on the southerly um, or the lower portion of the page that are circled. Um, they were um, developed through a subdivision application. There were technical studies supported, um, supporting that um, application. They dealt with noise and vibration adjacent to the aggregate resource extraction area. Um, those studies um, specifically identified mitigating measures um, that were part of the recommendations. Um, and the, the holding provisions that were applied in that case were for the implementation of those mitigating measures through the development um, um, 
agreement. Um, so the studies identified um, certain glazing, certain um, brick facing that was required, and the holding provisions was to ensure that was implemented through the development agreement. It was not to establish that the land use was appropriate as a holding provision. That had already been established through um, the regular course of the application. So I think that's the distinction between that particular example and what's being proposed here. We're still wrestling with the idea, is the land use appropriate here proximate to the aggregate resource extraction area. Um, similarly, for the um, property at the top of the page to the north, um, through the uh, official plan and rezoning applications, there were technical studies submitted in support of um, that um, rezoning and that form of development. I'm not aware that a holding provision was applied in that particular instance. I, I couldn't find a record of that. I, I can't speak to the to the third um, dwelling that's shown kind of in the center of the page there. Um, it doesn't meet the 150 meter um, setback distance, but I would say that it is considerably um, further east than where they are proposing to develop that third dwelling unit. Um, and, and that is similar to the properties on either side of the subject lands. The actual development is, is further east than uh, what the applicant is proposing right now. And so the balance of the rear yards would provide that bu buffer function to, I guess, the rear face of the dwelling unit. Uh, whereas in this particular instance, uh, they're actually looking for um, the third dwelling unit to be um, uh, very uh, close to the westerly property line, much more so than the adjacent development. Um, with regards to your question um, that dealt with the um, EA process uh, for the commissioner's road realignment, um, I'm not directly involved in that, but I would expect um, through the EA process that they would have looked at, um, at least on a preliminary level, um, slope stability and, and, and the need for how that would be addressed through that process, and there would be a detailed design around that. Um, what I would say is that the provincial policy statement um, requires that there be a remediation plan um, by those that are um, extracting aggregate resources and that that be carried out. Um, uh, so the remediation would occur and then subsequent to that, there would be, um, you know, the potential for the um, the road realignment. Um, but again, that's something that, um, from a timeline, my understanding is could be a number of years out. Um, in the interim, uh, we still have the potential for uh, Lafarge to extract immediately adjacent, well, within 15 minutes, 15 meters, excuse me, of the shared property boundary. Um, unfortunately, they haven't been able to confirm to us whether there's any specific timing about that, but there is that potential and the PPS um, would require us to protect for that potential. Thank you, that's helpful. And the uh, uh, the remediation plan itself from 2006, I imagine is a Lafarge uh, remediation plan and could be subject to any changes that might be associated with an EA for the commissioner's road alignment. I can't speak directly to that. Um, again, that's that's not the realignment EA processes is not a, a project that I'm um, directly involved in. So, sorry. I, perhaps to be clearer, though, the 2006 remediation plan may not be the final plan. There may be a subsequent one or an update. Through you, Mr. Chair, that that could be a possibility. Thank you. Uh, look to the committee for any, any other questions. Councillor Hopkins. I think the more we discuss this, the more confusing it becomes. I, I want to talk about the uh, road realignment. So we've just had an environmental assessment on the road alignment. And I, I'm just looking at it from, if we can allow a road to go through this area, I'm not sure what the concern or I, I, I hear what the concern is, but could we not put measures in place to make sure that when development does occur, that mitigation, just like in the other uh, developments near the edge of the pit have occurred, that the applicant put those in place? Uh, it, it may sound like a silly question, but if we know a road's going by, why could we not do that for a house? Mr. Chair, it, it's, it's not a silly question, by the way, because we struggled with the same 
things. Uh, and the challenge that we had is what are the certainties that we know? And at this time, we, there are limited certainties. So I was just speaking with Mr. Al Mahoon as well about the, the EA, and that road project is a 2037 project, so it's still a long way away. And one of the questions I, I asked, and we're a little bit uncertain about this, is if extraction continues, and especially up to 15 meters of the property line, how does that impact the EA? And again, we're just not sure. And until we know, um, until Lafarge surrenders that license, and again, we just don't know, um, I, I think anything to, uh, any presumptu presumptions about what's gonna happen to this pit is, is just that, it's a presumption. And so I'd rather deal in certainties, and, and I'm short of that at the moment. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so is there a possibility, since this is premature, that we could refer it back until Lafarge has stopped its extraction? It would, would that be a possibility? Uh, Mr. Chair, that's something that certainly council can do. Uh, we're still struggling, though, with the timing of that and, and how long we could refer this back for. One of the things we're concerned about, that as the London plan comes into force, we don't want to continue dealing with 89 plan applications, and I'd have to just confirm whether or not this is one of those, but we want to make sure we're only dealing with one official plan and, and not dealing with two, and as long as we keep going in the future with referrals, we might still be juggling with two applications. And theoretically, it could be um, referred back to staff for a decade or so. I think, uh, Councillor Hopkins, one of the challenges uh, with this is that, uh, that a referral back is usually for some sort of activity, not to just be kind of held in perpetuum until uh, some sort of uh, uh, conditions change. Um, so I, th I think we need to dispose of it one way or the other. Uh, I would look to the committee if there's any further discussion or questions uh, to ask them and bring them forward, or I would look for a motion. Um, to some effect. We have a staff recommendation that's put, put forward. And Councilor Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, make a comment about the application itself. And, and, and I know it's quite different from applications that have come before us in the past. Um, or not necessarily applications that have come before us, but the results of previous councils moving too quickly in areas um, which then led to conflicts. And so I know we have a, we've had um, different issues before this council, especially where there's urban and rural conflict. And, 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 and while this is different, I, I can foresee that that the same sort of repercussions if we were to uh, not go uh, ahead with the staff recommendation on this. And that concerns me. Um, you know, I, I worked for many years in Toronto and one of my clients in Toronto was, was Bombardier. And just as I was coming back to London, there were a number of residential homeowners in the area that had begun to complain about the noise and activity at Bombardier even though that plant had been in operation for a number of years. So we run into these kinds of conflicts and it's fine for us to say, well, it's okay for us to move ahead with this. This activity will be, will be coming to an end at some point. But um, I'm just very wary of, of taking that sort of position and, and um, I'm, I'm in favor of the staff recommendation and I, and I would be happy to move that. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. I'd look for a second for that motion. Councillor Helmer. Okay. Any further discussion? Right. Seeing none, we'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Okay, thank you. 
That brings us over to item 3.4, which is public participation meeting with respect to 324 York Street. Uh, I'd like the committee open the public participation meeting. Moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Hopkins. I'll open the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Okay, welcome, Ms. Lowry. Did I say it right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I just want to in introduce the committee to Catherine Lowry. Many of you may have met Catherine already through planning applications, but this is her first presentation at planning committee. Catherine joined us in July, and we were lucky enough to poach her from the city of Kitchener. And so their loss is our gain, and I'm sure you'll be seeing more of Catherine at this committee in the future. Welcome, Ms. Lowry. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Thomas and Sick. Uh, so the subject property is 324 York Street. This is the location of the subject site. Uh, it's located on the southeast end of downtown with access and frontage off of both York Street and Waterloo Street. The site is irregular in shape and is just under 1,500 square meters in area and is currently operating as a surface commercial parking lot and is surrounded by a commercial, surface commercial parking lot to the north, the London Convention Center to the west, an automobile sales and service uh, establishment to the southeast, and across Waterloo Street is the London Middlesex EMS headquarters building. So a little bit of planning history. In 2002, council had approved a zoning bylaw amendment to permit uh, the surface commercial parking lot for a temporary period of three years. Since then, periodic extensions to the temporary zone have allowed the use to continue over the years. And most recently, an extension was permitted in December of 2017, which approved a short-term six-month extension, allowing the owner some time to implement the requirements of the approved site plan from 2004. Since that time, the owner has completed all required site works, which included uh, formalizing entrances through the installation of curbing and landscaping off of both York Street and Waterloo Street, relocation of the ticket machine from the city boulevard, and installation of sod, planting, and trees. So these photos here show uh, the subject property from both the York Street frontage and the Waterloo Street frontage. You can see the uh, upgrades to the site being the formalized entrances with curbing and landscaping, as well as the ticket uh, machine has been located uh, just behind the planning application sign there. So the property is located within the downtown area designation of the 1989 official plan, as well as the downtown place type in the London plan. The existing zoning is a holding DA1 zone with special provisions, uh, as well as permissions for height and density, and the temporary use T71 zone, which permitted a temporary surface commercial parking lot for six months and has since expired on June 12, 2018. So the requested amendment is to extend the temporary use T71 zone to allow the site to function as a surface commercial parking lot for another temporary period of three years. However, the recommended amendment is to extend the temporary use T71 zone for a shorter term period of six months in order to allow users of the surface commercial parking lot to find alternative parking arrangements. So some policy context, uh, starting with the provincial policy statement, policies in the PPS uh, promote densities and land uses that support efficient use of land and resources, support active transportation and are transit supportive where transit is planned, exists or may be developed. Uh, the PPS encourages land use patterns, densities and a mix of uses that reduce length and number of vehicle trips. And further, the PPS encourages long-term prosperity to be supported by maintaining and enhancing the vitality and viability of downtowns and main streets. So staff is of the opinion that the requested amendment for the three-year extension does, is not consistent with these policies. However, uh, we're of the opinion that the recommended amendment for the shorter-term six-month extension uh, is. 
Moving into the 1989 official plan and the London plan, uh, as mentioned previously, the property is designated downtown area and, was in, and is within the downtown place type, um, which permit a wide range of residential, commercial, and retail uses, though do not permit uh, surface commercial parking lots. Policies in both the 89 plan and the London plan establish evaluation criteria for temporary use bylaws which staff is of the opinion that the requested amendment does, is not in conformity with. However, the recommended shorter term amendment does satisfy this criteria. In addition, policies in both the 1989 official plan and the London plan establish specific criteria to evaluate requests for temporary extensions to existing service commercial parking lots. We are of the opinion that the recommended amendment satisfies these criteria, and in particular, one policy which allows council to extend temporary zones for uh, surface commercial parking lots on a short-term basis to allow users to uh, find alternative parking arrangements. The property is identified as an underutilized site in our Move Forward London's downtown plan. And the policy direction of this plan encourages the redevelopment of vacant sites and the discontinuation of temporary use zoning uh, to facil facilitate redevelopment of these underutilized sites. <coughs> Further, the downtown parking strategy, um, which is recently approved, recommends a gradual approach to discontinuing temporary zone permissions for surface commercial parking lots where utilization is low. And as you can see on this map, the subject property is located uh, within area five, which has a lower utilization rate of 57%. So as such, uh, staff is recommending that the requested amendment to extend the temporary zone for a period of three years be refused and is further recommending that the recommended amendment to extend the temporary zone for a shorter period of six months be approved, it being noted that the intent of the short-term extension is to allow users of the lot to find alternative parking arrangements uh, and is consistent with the policies of the uh, provincial policy statement, uh, the 1989 official plan, and the London plan. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, look to the committee for any questions of a technical nature. Seeing none at the time, I would look to the applicant. Is there a representative from the applicant here? Welcome. On or? Can you hear me? Yep. So I just want to say a, a few things here uh, in support of our application. So um, this application came through in December of 2017, um, and we were granted a six-month extension uh, to permit the 2004 site plan improvements uh, to be made. While we acknowledge these improvements uh, should have been done previously, had it been made clear to us that there would be amendments to the official plan, the London plan, and the downtown plan that would impl implement criteria to militate against the extension of the temporary zoning designation, uh, our client likely would not have undertaken such works, uh, which has now made the parking lot more permanent. Secondly, um, the planning report in support of the December 2017 committee meeting, which I previously referenced, uh, was supported heavily by the rapid transit plan as justification for declining our three-year extension. Um, there is no mention of this rapid transit plan in the planning report for this committee meeting, uh, but is largely reliant on the, the new criteria enacted to consider these temporary commercial parking lots. Uh, I'm not aware of the current status of the, the rapid transit plan. Lastly, um, the lot immediately to the west of our client's lands is also a commercial surface area parking lot that's owned by the city. Uh, the temporary zoning of that property, the city property, expired in January 2010, uh, and it does not appear to be receiving the, the same scrutiny that our client's property is receiving. That's all. Okay, thank you. Can I get your name and uh, who you represent? Yeah, my name's Mr. Patrick Clancy. I'm from Mackenzie Lake Lawyers on behalf of the applicant, uh, Burdell Properties. Thank you, Mr. Clancy. Any questions of a technical nature for the applicant? Seeing none at this time. I look to the community. Uh, anyone wishing to speak on this matter? I'll ask a second time. And one third time. 
I see none. I will uh, take a motion to close the public participation meeting. Moved by Councillor Casty, seconded by Councillor Hopkins. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Look to the committee for questions or discussion. Uh, Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Van Holst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through through you to staff, uh, I, uh, the applicant's agent did uh, raise a question for me, which is uh, city-owned lots. To the, do through you to staff, do they go through this same process as uh, privately owned surface parking lots that have temporary exemptions? Uh, Mr. Chair, it, any site that's not grandfathered would require the zoning bylaw amendment to be processed through planning services. And so through you, Mr. Chair, is the city-owned lot immediately west of this lot, is it a grandparented lot, or have we seen that um, come forward for, for an extension? Mr. Chair, that's something that we'll have to look up. Uh, so if we could just have a little bit of time on that one, that'd be great. Thank you. Councillor Van Holst. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I just wanted to raise a point about the long-term prosperity and viability. Uh, we're looking at a film industry strategy, actually a screen-based industry strategy, and that's that's been a little bit delayed. It's, I think it's coming to us uh, for a report perhaps next month. Uh, however, uh, parking lots downtown in cities where films are being made are gold because there are places where the trailers can be put and those are very, very much in demand. And just looking at that picture, uh, you can see how that would be uh, a, a great location and a huge asset for our, our city, where which would put us in a competitive position uh, with respect to Toronto say so I think for that reason I might be very tempted to just support the the request of the applicant Further questions Just looking back at uh, the 2017 uh, reports so uh, there was a bit of back and forth uh, between the committee and between council as well uh, at the time um, the, uh, the staff recommendation was, uh, uh, summary of the recommendation was the recommended action will result in the use of service commercial parking lot for a temporary period of six months in order to provide time for the requirements of the approved development agreement to be implemented. Uh, the committee at that time uh, did not recommend the approval. It went forward uh, with a split decision, but, uh, but the recommendation was to refuse the application at council. Uh, then it subsequently, uh, uh, went forward for a six-month uh, extension. So that brings us back to here right now, uh, and that, uh, that's the question. Uh, now, in the original uh, recommendation from staff was uh, for six months in order to provide the requirements for the approved development agreement to be implemented, which was the site plan conditions. Uh, that wasn't uh, in, in the wording in the council motion. It was just a six-month extension. Uh, itself. So the question ultimately uh, was that at the same time as that came forward uh, was the uh, the parking strategy where it started making recommendations and discussion about uh, how we would move forward and identifying lots that may or may not be considered for extension. So that's just kind of a, my history lesson to, to bring us to where we are right now. I think more so for uh, for those who may be observing and to buy time for Mr. Tomsinzik to research his, uh, his answer. Uh, through the chair, the, the uh, lot, I believe it's at 300 York Street, um, the convention center lot is that we're, that we're talking about, is a commercial lot. It is owned by the city. It is legal. Um, uh, and it is owned uh, appropriately as a, as a legal public use uh, uh, property. So um, there's no need for any further approvals with that lot. I'm not sure what the question was in regards to uh, from, the, from the proponent. 
so that uh, for clarification, it is not a lot that requires every three years a temporary renewal of, perm uh, of parking permissions. It's a, it's a lot that's permitted to, uh, under its own zoning. That is correct. Mr. Cassidy, anything to follow? Okay. Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And just following up on your summation of what we had done previously, I do have a question, and maybe it, it can be directed to the applicant. At that time, I, I did think that we were in the process of giving a temporary parking um, allowance or extension, knowing that it was just a six-month extension. So I guess, um, was there any doubt? Uh, just hearing from the applicant saying that they did the upgrades, assuming that we would just extend the parking lot. I, I, I'm just trying to understand how clear were we and can we be doing a better job when it comes to extensions and giving temporary extensions? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe the, the staff report was that the indicated pretty clearly that the six month extension was granted to permit the time to have the works done in that period of time. That was the purpose of the six month extension. So that's what our client was relying on. And, and just for clarification, I believe the address of the, the lot that I previously mentioned was 299 King Street. Perhaps that could be confirmed because I do believe that it has a temporary zoning of uh, T-53. Thank you. At this point, uh, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, just following up on that. So the extension that we gave for six months was to do temporary uh, work on upgrading the parking lot? So, just for some clarification here. Yeah, Councillor Hopkins, as uh, I mentioned, the uh, original staff uh, recommendation to the planning committee was that six months in order to provide that opportunity to provide the, uh, to provide the required site to plan um, features to be, uh, to be done. They hadn't been done uh, over that period of time. The subsequent motion that came forward at council did not have that wording. It was just for a six-month extension. Councilor Van Holst. So then, <clears throat> then for clarification, it, it does seem like we had asked them to make these improvements. We gave them six months to make these improvements. And then at that point, I, we would expect that they would be able to keep running the parking lot. But we actually did not uh, officially ask them to make those improvements. They just did it on their own. And uh, at this point, their six months extension is up. This is where we are. Councilor Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So to, to be clear, we had, they were asked to make these improvements in 2004. And, and I recall the meeting very well when this issue came, came to us. They chose not to make these improvements since 2004. So and another point, you know, notwithstanding the councillor's um, advocacy for uh, a nascent film industry here in London. Uh, this is a site that's been identified through a downtown parking strategy that we asked our staff to prepare. And the point of the strategy is to identify lots that may be viable for development and where there, the loss of surface parking would be less um, uh, painful to the downtown area. So this is, this is an ideal site. It's the second lowest uptake in, in surface parking use in the downtown area that's been identified in the strategy. Um, it's, it's, it's an amazing and wonderful idea to have ample surface parking lots available to park film uh, equipment and vehicles, but it, it's also a bit uh, of a 
a, a, again, a temporary use in and of itself. And I would rather see the certainty of property taxes from a large downtown residential, maybe residential combined with commercial building developed on the site. We hear often that there's no market for downtown uh, development. We, we, we hear that often from one or two um, individuals in the city, but we have other developers that are proving them wrong and they are actively pursuing applications for high rise, high density downtown development on, on underutilized sites. And, and so we have to really put our money where our mouths are. And if we're going to want to encourage um, increased density, increased residential development in our downtown core, which leads to rejuvenation, an increased rejuvenation of our downtown core, then we really have to implement the strategies that our staff have, have um, brought to us and recommended to us and that we've supported. And they're good strategies. And the, the parking strategy was a very well thought out, very well prepared strategy um, by our staff. And I think uh, we are going over the next few years to be presented with opportunities to support that strategy as well as others. And I think it's um, incumbent on us to, to support the strategies that we've implemented for very, uh, um, very good reason. So I will support the staff recommendation on this and, uh, and I'll be happy to move that as well. Okay, we've got a motion moved by Councillor Cassidy. Look for a second. Councillor Hopkins? Um, yes, I, I have. Okay, Councillor Hopkins seconding it and with a question. And I think uh, Mr. Thompson also wanted to speak as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure if this will be helpful or not, but the difference between uh, what happened between that uh, six month extension last year was since that time, Council adopted new policies. And so now staff are obligated to follow the new official plan criteria for how we assess downtown parking. And uh, uh, when we met with the applicant through pre-consultation, and I'm looking at the record of pre-application consultation, the applicant was informed that uh, new criteria had been established and based on the pre preliminary review of these, this application that the site would not appear to satisfy those criteria. We did advise the applicant in pre-consultation that at, and at that time they hadn't fulfilled the site plan requirements. Uh, that if they do fulfill the site plan requirements, they'd be rolling the dice because you improve the site, but the application could be refused, or you leave the site as is, but not apply. And then on um, June 7th, I have an application from the app, or an email from the applicants indicating that they wish to proceed with the application. And in doing so, they fulfill the site plan requirements. So I hope that provides a bit of a timeline. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. That's very helpful. Uh, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, just to make a comment, I, I am supportive of our new strat strategy plan for sure. And this is a site that is in an area of 57%, it's area five. It's uh, a gradual approach. The applicant does have six months to um, uh, find, to to keep that the parking on the site and to find other means for the the um, the use of the land, I think we have to encourage redevelopment downtown. It's it's um, important, uh, and I am supportive. Thank you, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, Councillor Helmer, did you have your hand up? Yeah. If you could just call the two different parts separately. Yeah. Thank you. Just to, for clarification, you want A and B called separately, uh, Councillor Helmer? Okay. All right. Uh, we have it moved and seconded. Uh, we'll uh, proceed with uh, Clause A first, that uh, the temporary use for three years be refused. Calling the vote.
closing the vote. The motion carries four to zero. Okay, and uh, bringing clause B up that uh, appendix A uh, be introduced for six months, six extension uh, for a period not exceeding six months. Closing the vote, the motion carries three to one. Okay, thank you. It moves us along to item 3.5, public participation meeting with respect to uh, 1395 River Bend. Uh, take a motion to open the public participation meeting. Moved by Councillor Hopkins and seconded by Councillor Helmer. I'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Looks like Mr. Mottram's already. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, an application for a, a proposed zoning bylaw amendment at 1395 River Bend Road, and the applicant is Sifton Properties, and representatives from Siftons and their consultants are in attendance uh, this evening. The, uh, the development proposal uh, in, is an application for um, zoning amendments to permit uh, senior citizens apartment building and retirement residence on the um, east portion of the subject site, as well as uh, to allow for f future townhomes on the westerly portion of the site. Uh, the site is located at the uh, southwest corner of River Bend Road and Shore Road, and it's in the uh, Sifton West Five development in the uh, River Bend. The uh, site is, is currently vacant, it has a frontage of 57 meters on River Bend Road and a, and a depth and a flankage on Shore Road of 220 meters and a total area of 1.45 hectares. Now the area that of, of, out of here that will be, out of this parcel that will be for the um, seniors' uh, apartments and retirement residences, a little over 0.8 of a hectare. The surrounding land uses to the north is an existing uh, uh, elementary school, uh, St. Nicholas Catholic Elementary School. There is a neighborhood park, River Bend Park, and there are uh, existing single detached residential dwellings fronting on, to, um, River Bend, on the uh, west side of River Bend Road. Uh, lands to the south are currently vacant, but are planned for um, higher density, um, higher uh, profile uh, um, mixed use buildings that are, um, one is currently under construction further to the south at the corner of uh, future Linkway Boulevard and River Bend Road. And um, to the east is the Siftons uh, townhouses and, and stacked townhouses, the solar townhomes that are um, nearing completion. And then lands uh, to the west are also vacant but are planned for future medium density residential uh, uh, townhouses uh, and uh, various forms of cluster housing. The site uh, uh, consists of lands also uh, within a recently registered plan of subdivision. It's part of block one of registered plan 33M743. The site is currently being used as a construction staging area for, for developments that Siftons is undertaking in that area. And it was previous to that uh, a cultiv cultivated field for, uh, for crops. There are no natural heritage features vegetation or, or tree cover within the uh, area of the site. This is a, a, a concept site plan that was uh, um, submitted with the uh, zoning application. Um, it proposes uh, a two-phase development consisting of a senior citizen's apartment building being the westerly wing to be constructed as phase one and a future retirement residence which is the easterly wing to be constructed as phase two. 
the buildings will be physically co connected upon completion. Phase one is proposed to accommodate 98 retirement apartments plus a common lounge and dining space. Phase two is proposed to accommodate 100 uh, retirement home suites with a total of 124 beds plus common lounge and recreational therapy administrative, administrative and dining spaces. The building uh, will consist of a six story residential wings and a partial seventh floor accommodating the main dining rooms for both buildings. It will feature um, a single slope cantilevered uh, roof to optimize uh, rooftop solar energy production. Parking is proposed underground with access from Riverbend Road via a common internal access driveway. Visitor parking is also provided on, uh, on, the, on the site uh, with access from Shore Road. The remainder of the site to the west is anticipated to be developed for future townhouses as illustrated on the uh, concept site development plan. In the um, London plan, the place type here is neighborhoods. In the 1989 official plan designation, the lands here are designated as multifamily medium density residential as well as there are special policies that have been, uh, that were adopted as part of the uh, official plan and then later carried over into the London plan called the uh, Riverbend West Five specific area policies. And the report has uh, gone, ahead, gone into um, more further analysis and a review of all of the policies uh, for West Five here that are um, in place to help guide future development of the West Five area. The zoning is, um, it is, uh, has, has a, a, a various zone variations uh, in a compound zone. R5-6 allows townhouses and stacked townhouses. R65 allows various forms of attached and detached uh, cluster housing. The R7 zoning that is currently in place does permit nursing homes, senior citizens, senior citizens apartment buildings, and retirement residences. And the R8-4 zone uh, is a zone variation that permits a low rise apartment buildings. There are holding provisions in place on the zoning that were approved um, at the time that the subdivision was approved by council. Uh, an NH uh, for a requirement for a, a development a subdivision and, and development agreements to be entered into with the city. And H-206 uh, is a special holding provision for compliance with the uh, West Five Urban Design Guidelines, which Council has uh, adopted at, at the time in 2015 when the West Five uh, Draft Plan of Subdivision was approved. So with the um, notices that were uh, circulated to the public, responses back from the public indicated um, we had five re uh, email replies were received. I just wanted to indicate to you that the, uh, the notices did uh, provide an overview of the development proposal being a six to seven story seniors apartment building and retirement residence and future townhouses on the westerly portion of the site. Um, it, it was also, um, um, emphasize that the residential R5 zone was proposed to be removed as well as the residential R8 zoning would be uh, removed from the site and the, uh, recommend uh, the uh, request was to maintain the R6 zone to uh, um, continue to allow for uh, cluster housing. The um, proposed changes to the R7 special provision zone uh, included uh, a special provision for front and exterior side yard depth to the main building, a minimum of three meters, uh, a front and exterior side yard depth to the, um, to the site triangle, that being the uh, right at the intersection of the corner of Riverbend Road and Shore Road of 0 0.8 meters. A uh, lot coverage maximum of 40%, which would be um, an, an increase under the R7 zone of from 35 percent to 40 percent lot coverage but that 40 percent coverage it currently is in place under the r8 zone in any event and a required uh, parking of a minimum of 120 spaces the main issues in response to the public notification were, were these traffic congestion on shore road and um, 
as well as the impact of the proposed building height on um, surrounding residential uses, uh, shadowing and loss of privacy. The, uh, the traffic on Shore Road uh, is, is in front of an uh, elementary school that is already uh, very busy. And this is what the response from the public was most concerned about, is that cars are parking along the road at school pick up and drop off times. Um, this is slowing uh, traffic flow, um, causing congestion and, and creating unsafe conditions. Shore Road and River Bend Road um, are, uh, at least River Bend Nor Road north of Shore Road uh, is classified as neighborhood connectors in the, in the uh, London plan. The, uh, they and carrying on average 2,000 uh, vehicles per day. On, on River Bend Road, 500 vehicles uh, trips per day is the annual uh, daily traffic count on Shore Road. The proposed uh, development is not expected to contribute significantly to traffic volumes on either road. The responses received from the community engagement process indicated that congestion in this area is heavy, particularly do, during uh, school drop-off and pickup times. Uh, vehicular access to the site is proposed from both Shore Road and River Bend Road. The site plan, which is currently being reviewed, indicates that the uh, proposed uh, west access on Shore Road will be aligned with the elementary school parking lot access to the north. Um, the west access, uh, would, which you can see here with uh, um, red arrows, uh, with directional red arrows into the site has been designed to be in, inbound only, as well as designed to meet the uh, requirements for a fire route. The easterly access is designed to be outbound only and be wide enough to accommodate one-way traffic flow. Access to the building's underground parking garage, which will hold um, 122 uh, spaces, access to the loading and receiving ramp and the garbage and, rec and recycling collection facility will all be provided by a common internal uh, driveway access from River Bend Road on the southerly side of the site. The access to the parking garage is identified uh, on, the, on the westerly side of the phase one building. The, um, with respect to the impact of the uh, building height and shadowing, loss of privacy issues, the uh, master plan concept that was prepared for um, West Five community has always shown uh, retirement uses for the subject site. The uh, concept plan identified two L-shaped buildings, including one five-story building on the easterly side of the site, forming a street wall along River Bend Road and Shore Road, opposite a six-story building on the westerly side of the site. As detailed site design and, and building plans emerged, the uh, general configuration was revised so that the two buildings could be connected physically. The uh, U-shaped configuration of the building does not create a continuous street wall along Shore Road. However, staff do agree with the applicant's justification report that it does respect the existing elementary school and single family homes to the north by setting the main building mass back and helping to minimize visual intrusion and shadowing. This is the uh, view of the um, architect's rendering of, uh, of the north elevation sh uh, along Shore Road. As noted in the urban design brief that was submitted uh, with the application, the intent is to provide a consistent street frontage along Shore Road that is bracketed by the uh, end wings of the two buildings and landscaped to create a buffer between the parking and public sidewalk through um, provision of drought tolerant landscaping and low masonry garden walls to match the building. Tree planting will be required at a rate of one per 15 meters along the interior property line and one per 12 meters along all street property lines, in addition to uh, the Boulevard Street tree plantings. The enhanced landscape buffer will help lessen to some extent the visual impact as well as provide screening for adjacent properties to the north. 
The uh, east and, and west wings are to be six stories in height with a partial seventh floor incorporating the common dining room over the um, southerly back half of the building. You can see that in the profile here, and you can also see the angle at which the cantilevered roof has been designed in order to uh, provide for uh, solar photovoltaic cells. Um, well, one, one story above the original concept plan for the site, the additional story uh, serves to provide some additional architectural interests. Excellent views of the surrounding area, and it reduces the building footprint, allowing for uh, an increased landscaped areas, amenity areas for the residents as well. Uh, shadow studies were prepared as part of the urban design brief, um, which demonstrate that the effects of shadowing at different times of the day during different seasons. Um, the, this, these studies uh, indicated that the proposed six to seven story building will have minimal impact on the surrounding residential and school properties for most of the year. The study illustrations indicate only substantial shadow cast on the properties north of Shore Road would be experienced during the winter solstice in December 21st. The, uh, the R strategy, city building and design, the neighborhood place type and the R tool uh, policies in the London plan as well as the West Five specific area policies have been reviewed and consideration given to how the proposal contributes to achieving those policy objectives. So this uh, proposal was found to represent a compatible fit in terms of the form, scale and intensity within the context of the existing plan future development for this area. So our recommendation on the application before us that we're tabling is uh, uh, to approve the requested zoning amendment. Uh, the recommended zoning and the special provisions are appropriate and conform with the London plan, the River Bend uh, West Five specific area policies, the 1989 official plan, and are consistent with the provincial policy statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Montrum. Any questions of a technical nature for staff? Seeing none, uh, yes, Mr. Yeoman. Uh, if I could, Mr. Chair, just to clarify the recommendation that's before you, um, Ms. Zunti and uh, the representatives of Sifton are going to be speaking shortly. Uh, they're actually going to be requesting a referral uh, of this at this time. Uh, there's been some challenges and uh, details that have been provided related to this application late last week. Uh, she'll speak to that, but uh, the recommendation will be coming back to committee uh, along these lines with the changes that will be before you. Thank you very much. That would be my next stop. Ms. Zunti. I believe uh, representing the applicant. Welcome. Just need you to turn your mic on, though. <laughs> OK. I knew I had to push something. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank staff for processing this application quite quickly. We really appreciate that. And uh, as mentioned, ironically, we're going to be requesting a deferral on this decision because something came to light um, about a week to 10 days ago that uh, we are going to be submitting a revision to the application. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail after our architect makes a presentation. Um, I did want to also note that we did actually have uh, an informal public meeting with people in the neighborhood back in uh, August, August 21st, prior to this meeting because we wanted to get comments and concerns. And as noted in Mr. Mott's report, um, the primary issue actually that came up was the issue of the, the traffic on Shore Road, which we don't believe that we will be contributing to in any major amount. Um, I am going to get uh, Richard Hammond from Cornerstone Architecture to provide us with, uh, or provide you, with a brief overview of the proposed development. And then I'm going to speak to what we're going to be looking at in terms of changes, just so you're aware of that. Um, but we still obviously want to have the uh, meeting proceed and then we can uh, respond to any comments or concerns on this application and then I presume there will be a second public meeting that will be required as a result of our uh, revisions that will be coming in. So, Richard. Thank you, Maureen. Good, good evening, everyone. I'm Richard Hammond from Cornerstone Architecture. And just wait one moment. 
Um, further to Mr. Mottram's presentation, I wanted to highlight a couple of things to show you how we arrived at the uh, current proposal. As he had indicated, we started with the overall master plan for uh, West 5 that shows these two L-shaped buildings here in this location. And as we began the design process, uh, we realized that that configuration is quite uh, constraining for this type of use. Uh, it limits the amount of open space and also because of the um, uh, uh, building mass along Shore Road has a fairly significant impact on the, on the street space. So looking at all those factors together, um, we developed the U-shaped plan that you've seen uh, to accommodate the residential units in phase one is apartments, phase two is retirement homes so that they have more separation from one another. Uh, also to open up more amenity space on the main floor and permit drop-off on the site rather than on the street that would have been necessary under the original scheme. And to do that, um, we moved the dining room up to the top floor. That has a number of advantages, including uh, adding a little bit of interest to the profile of the building, making a lovely place for dining. The view should be great from there. You should be able to see the river uh, to the north and, um, as I mentioned, allow more circulation and amenity space at grade on the site. So there's a 3D view of the model looking from Shore Road. You can see the drop-off area in front, the six-story wings on the side, and you can just see the seventh-story dining room on the roof. So we think that really adds some interest to the building and makes for better quality uh, residential units on the first few floors and a dining space on the top floor. Uh, that's a view from Shore Road, again, showing the building set back as opposed to the original idea, which would be set out all the way along to the street. Um, and just some quick images from the shadow study. We compared the footprint of the original proposed configuration and the shadows that it would cast to the proposed design. And um, the overall outline of the shadows are very similar but the, um, the shadows are lessened along the center of the site simply because that mass of the building, that higher portion, is set back further. So I hope that provides a little context and be happy to answer questions. Thank you. So to just come back briefly, um, the reason we're requesting a deferral is that as a result of the more detailed architectural and engineering design, we were recently made aware that with new construction techniques, it would be possible to add some additional units to both the seniors apartment and the retirement suites. So we'll be revising the application to increase the number of units um, for both of those um, uses. Um, and that will require a change to the density that's associated with the R7. Uh, we will not be requesting a change to any of the other special provisions. The, the height and the setbacks will all remain the same, but because of how they are doing the construction and how the, the floors work and so on, they are actually gonna be able to get another floor in there because of how the, I'm not an architect, so I can't explain it. Um, so the, the number of units would increase by, I think it's 17 units for the apartment building and um, I think it's 20 retirement suites, something like that. So we will be coming back with a revised application just to change the density, but not to change anything else in the proposed um, zoning bylaw. Um, so if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now or we can try and um, respond to any questions or concerns that come up from the public. Thank you, Ms. Something. I'd look to the committee. Any questions of a technical nature for the applicant? I'm not seeing none at this point. I would look to the community. Uh, anyone wishing to speak to this application? I'll check a second time. I'm calling one third time for anybody wishing to speak to the application. I see none. I will take a motion to close the public participation meeting. Moved by Councillor Hopkins, seconded by Councillor Helmer. I'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. It sounds like the request is actually for a referral. So I look uh, 
committee to see if uh, moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Hammer. Discussion, uh, Councillor Hawkins? Yeah, so I have uh, no problem referring this. Obviously, it is about density. A lot of my questions I had are about the um, the access onto Shore Road and the construction route. And I want to thank Sifton, first of all, for holding an open house there. The community um, uh, came out, and, and I hear loud and clear from the community the concerns from Shore Road. It's a narrow road, uh, and uh, the school being across uh, the way and the need to improve congestion. So I don't know if, uh, I, I assume I can um, leave my questions until the next public meeting, but I do want to express those concerns. Uh, one, the congestion going onto uh, Shore Road, the access from the seniors' home, uh, and uh, the Construction route too, not being allowed to go on Shore Road. It's something that just creates more uh, congestion on the road. I uh, want to probably reserve the rest of my um, questions at, at, at another time, but I want to leave that with the applicant. I do want to say, though, um, that West 5, this is a pretty exciting development in in Ward 9, uh, it's all about sustainable living and having a senior and retirement home will give the community a great opportunity more or less to age in place. So I am supportive of uh, the proposal in front of us, but have many questions about how we're going to deal with congestion on Shore Road. Any further uh, discussion? Yeah. We have a motion uh, to refer back to staff, uh, seconded, and uh, without any further discussion, I'll call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Thank you. Uh, this brings us to item 3.6, which was a request for delegation we received about a month ago uh, with respect to the Byron Valley nature uh, trail planning process. We have a uh, second uh, request for delegation status that perhaps uh, we might be able to address that first before moving forward. Um, I would uh, look to the committee to see if they uh, wish to entertain that request. Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, I, I'd be um, pleased to support the second delegation. Seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Okay, uh, to this matter, we have a brief staff report. I believe we have some members from staff to present. Then we'll move to the delegations. Uh, and uh, I believe that's what most of the people are here for. So. Welcome. Great, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll just do a brief overview uh, before Linda gets started there. Uh, we have submitted a report for context for this project for you, page 193. Uh, just recommended to receive that uh, for your deliberations. Um, there's been about a two-year planning process, and just because some of the committee members uh, weren't here when the decision was made at, uh, at a rezoning stage for 1349 Commissioners Road West, uh, where lands were dedicated for public access and to protect some trees on the property uh, and zoned for open space. So uh, with that, Ms. McDougall will go through a presentation that kind of catches that two-year uh, planning process, and then, of course, we're available for questions. Thank you, Mr. McPherson. Welcome, Ms. McDougall. Thank you, Chairman. So uh, this is a great first photo. It shows the existing trail along the top of the Byron Dyke, and in, off to the north you can see the, the Thames River there. It's a, a beautiful area. The study area is located on public lands northwest of Commissioner's Road West at Halls Mills Road, south of the Thames River, and includes about five hectares of publicly owned lands. 
There are two city-owned rental homes inside the study area within the floodplain. There's an unopened road allowance and right-of-ways in the study area. Uh, the terminus of Halls Mill Road there to the north uh, appears, uh, when you're on the site, like a driveway, but it actually is a, a public right-of-way. And then there's the unopened road allowance there, the extension of Old Bridge Road, which has never been opened. This is the view looking west down Old Bridge Road to the terminus there. You can see the sewage pumping station in the center of the study area. There are a number of existing underground utilities that require ongoing access for maintenance. You can see the Byron Dyke itself here is a large linear berm feature, about 12 meters in width. You can see that there are many existing trails that already exist in the area and are informally in use. Folks trying to have access to nature in that neighborhood, including the unmanaged informal trail you saw in the first photo over the top of the Byron Dyke. The west portion of the Byron Valley is identified on the London Plan as an environmentally significant area. You can see the limits of it there with a little cutout for the sewage pumping station in purple. The orange is the parkland dedication for trail access that Andrew mentioned that was transferred to the city in 2018 as part of the apartment development. Currently on site, there are a number of known issues. There's some illegal activities, there's some trespassing, people uh, toing and froing on those informal trails, some party pits activity, a little bit of litter. Previously there was issues with vehicles uh, down near the sewage pumping station which was uh, addressed with a, a gate to block access there. And there is a, a very long list of invasive species in the area currently. Here you can see the site plan for that apartment building that shows that uh, parkland dedication parcel Back in 2016, staff was directed to provide the plan for the trail at a community meeting to be held in Byron and all interested parties be notified of the meeting. And staff was also directed to consult with the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority and other agencies with respect to the trail in the Byron Valley and potential impact to species at risk. So to address Part D, staff consulted with the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry in 2017, in November, with respect to species at risk in the trail, and it was identified concurrent with our findings that it's not nesting habitat for turtles, and we also retained biologists to carry out a three-season ecological inventory. Those photos, the one on the left, is a nice photo showing the forest uh, valley slope heading up towards commissioners there. Here's a nice view of the, the Thames River, and you can see how shady it is there on the banks of the Thames, because it's a north-facing slope or shore. And then you can, another photo there of the top of the Byron Dyke. So completion, completion of a natural heritage inventory and evaluation is a key first step in the nature trail planning process. Ecological information is gathered up front to ensure that the features and functions of London's natural heritage system will be identified and protected for the long term. The city retained professional biologists in 2017 to conduct a three-season ecological inventory. The biologists conducted ecological survey work between March and September of 2017, and this follows the city's data collection standards for ecological inventory and other provincially and federally accepted protocols. Background information, including other recent ecological studies, were reviewed, including the UTRCA's 2017 draft Byron Dyke Subject Land Status Report. The 2017 field program included carefully timed site visits by trained professionals to update the ecological land classification and ecosystem descriptions for the Byron Valley, which primarily consist of sugar maple hardwood deciduous forest on the valley slopes and Manitoba maple lowland deciduous forest on the valley floor. And these are commonly found along the Thames River in London. Following specific timing protocols, the area was searched for amphibians, birds, plants, reptiles, mammals, species at risk, and significant wildlife habitat. And the existing uses and disturbances were documented as I went through at the beginning of the slide presentation there. Key findings included significant wildlife habitat for groundwater seeps. 
Those are located over 60 meters east of the existing informal trail system on the valley slope. And they also identified that the forest supports significant wildlife habitat for bats and birds like the eastern wood peewee. Many forest habitats in London, including the Byron Valley, provide good bird and bat habitat. And as all the native trees will continue to be protected, wildlife and their habitat will continue to be protected in the Byron Valley. The biologists identified in their report that bats and eastern wood peewees are not particularly sensitive to the presence of passive recreational human activity in natural areas. These groundwater seeps, forest habitats, and all the species they support will continue to be protected, noting native trees will be protected and no native tree removals would be needed in order to implement the Trails Advisory Group's revised trail enhancement plan in your package. The biologists also noted that the density of tree cover and lack of open substrates for nested, nesting and north facing riverbanks are not good habitat for turtle nesting. The Thames River is a movement corridor for many species of turtles and this will continue to be protected. Correspondence with UTRCA staff and the UTRCA's Byron Dyke study confirmed our consultants' findings. Re-species at risk turtles and this area does not currently support nesting habitat for species at risk turtles as it is too shady. The biologist's findings were presented at the community meeting in March in Byron where they noted that the existing unmanaged informal trails and proposed trails within the study area were compatible with the surrounding significant ecological features. And this is also noted in the Trails Advisory Group minutes in Appendix 1 in the staff report in your package. The forest habitat and city-owned lawn areas in the Byron Valley could be further enhanced to improve local biodiversity through invasive species management and ecological restoration work. In November 2017, city staff also consulted with UTRCA and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry who had no concerns with respect to species at risk and the nature trail enhancements. And this was also noted at the community meeting in Byron. This was the plan presented to address part C of the council resolution, uh, the draft conceptual plan that was presented at the community meeting. And it was noted correctly that the trail avoids sensitive habitats and will continue to protect native trees and plant communities. It's a very simple trail plan that goes from Commissioner's Road West. You can see the white dots that lead uh, over that new parkland dedication parcel and then join up with existing an existing trail down that forest slope and then connects to a low-key lookout feature which would consist of one or two armor stones set back from the river's edge to provide a seat or a place to, to stop and enjoy nature. Uh, and then uh, another um, low-key nature trail connects up with the dike, which is the green and red dots there, uh, into an accessible trail loop that would go continue along the top of the dike uh, and then it could form kind of a trail loop uh, going over Halls Mills Road and even back along Old Bridge Road and then back up the slope to Commissioners. It's a lovely uh, low-key trail system um, under a kilometer in length. We heard from the community several concerns, wondering why we need a trail in the Byron Valley. They were concerned that trespassing would increase, privacy would be impacted, uh, suggesting some trails are unsafe, very concerned about species at risk as our city staff, um, lack of parking and increased use of the area could be a potential issue. There was also a lot of support for the trail uh, through the process. The residents are already using the trails and prefer they be made safer and the rules enforced. The trails could be a nice educational experience for students. Access to nature for local uh, residents in the nearby homes is a good amenity. And there was some interest in adopting the Byron Valley to assist with local stewardship and protection. Notably, Participation House welcomes any increased use of the Byron Valley area for community interaction with Byron Participation House residents, and they support an accessible trail to the River Edge. There was extensive community consultation from 2016 through 2018. Those details are also in your package, specifically uh, in 2017, we did that study. In 2018, we mailed the notices out. We published it in the Londoner and the Villager on the city event calendar. And we met with the Byron Community Organization in advance of that community meeting at the Byron Library. 
where we provided the trail concept plan. The last slide at that meeting identified that there would be a trails advisory group walk and uh, we coordinated that August 15th, 2018. Uh, and that included six members of the local Byron community who attended that walk, as well as other stakeholders who typically attend these meetings, following the terms of reference in your package. Uh, the neighbors then suggested that we should speak with Participation House directly. Uh, and even though they did receive a mail out, uh, we hadn't heard from them. So we proactively uh, met with them and they identified they were very much in favor of this and asked that I do a site visit with uh, the residents Chrissy and Jamie at the Byron Participation House and we toured them through the coves and the Byron Valley. Uh, and then October 15th, 2018, we mailed out the revised uh, trail enhancement plan. It's a simple process uh, that's been in place for about three years now, this trails advisory group process that includes reps from EPAC, Thames Valley Trail Association, Nature London, representatives from the local community, sometimes the councillor attends, uh, basically, we, we provide the trail concept plan in advance and then we take a walk, we look at solutions, we strive for consensus or at the very least a majority, make a decision on site and update that trail plan. And you'll see the results of that in your package. We've had a lot of success following this model. Uh, the coves in particular, the Brookdale area near East Pond uh, previously was not a managed trail system. Um, there was undesirable uses, there was litter, there wasn't a good sense of community using the, the space, and there were a lot of invasive species. And all of these things have now been addressed, and it really is a, a wonderful place to visit, and that's why we took our Trails Advisory Group for Byron to Coves first to see a first-hand example of success and what can be achieved through proper trail management and invasive species management and ecological restoration. Here's some photos of what those kind of trails look like. Here's a level one wood chip trail, which is about a five foot wide wood chip trail there along the East Cove. Bottom left, you can see a level two granular trail and look out, it's just a few armor stones. And the result of the Trails Advisory Group walk, we took those suggestions and feedback from the neighbors and community and revised that plan to better address issues like privacy, um, uh, accessibility uh, and, and um, things like uh, relocating a trail a little further down the slope so it wouldn't be visible from the homes uh, upon commissioners, the condos there. Um, and in general, we, we did reach a, a, general, a general consensus. So these were all the things we were able to address through that Trails Advisory Group walk and process. The Trails Advisory Group's uh, Trail Enhancement Plan reflects the London Plan. There's a lot of policies in there that this plan would address and meet and help fulfill. It satisfies requirements under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. It meets the Provincial Policy Statement 1.51, providing access to shorelines. It meets aid friendly London goals. It meets London's Accessibility Plan and it would also provide better protection of significant wildlife habitat. So subject to the direction of town council, we would report back to the community with the Trails Advisory Group's revised trail enhancement plan, and then engage the UTRCA to begin ESA management in 2019, and implement that revised plan also in 2019. And finally, there's a nice photo of that existing trail along the Byron Dyke that would continue to be accessible for those in the community upon implementation of the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McDowell. And from the community, we had a group. Welcome. And I believe you have a presentation as well. Okay, thank you. I'll let you get that set up. And I think uh, there's a request from Councillor Hopkins to uh, uh, to grant a bit more time. Uh, I think you had uh, just a bit over five minutes of, of time or content. So, yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. If we can allow the delegation about three more minutes. If I could get support from the committee. Okay. Seconded by Councillor Helmer. All in favor? Okay. 
just introduce yourself and uh, yeah, welcome aboard. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Park, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the delegation. Um, thank you very much for um, allowing us to speak today and for giving us the extra few minutes. Overwhelming opposition to the Byron Valley Nature Trail has been voiced at two separate meetings. On November 2017, due to opposition, City Council directed the Environment, Environmental and Parks Planning Services to have a public participation meeting in Byron to present the plan for the Byron, Nature, Byron Valley Nature Trail. At this meeting held on March the 8th, 2018, it was revealed that this plan could be whatever the community wanted. Approximately 80 people attended the meeting and all but a few turned down the entire project, wanting the ESA left untouched. It was assumed at that meeting that, that it would not proceed, but they have. This trail would cause an irreversible environmental damage to the area. It's a tiny ESA surrounded by private property, so it cannot become part of another trail system. This ESA is the only waterfront property not on private land or part of a multi-use path from the Forks of the Thames to the ESA. This ESA is the documented habitat of the eastern hognose snake with photos and site location registered with the Ministry of Natural Resources. The eastern hognose snake is listed as threatened under the Ontario Endangered Species Act and the Federal Species at Risk Act and designated specially protected reptile under the Ontario Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act. Its habitat is further protected in Ontario by the Provincial Policy Statement, which protects the habitat of threatened and endangered species and prohibits site alterations to their habitat. Section 6 of the Provincial Planning Act for Species at Risk states, that a wildlife habitat is defined as an entire area on which a species depends directly or indirectly. Areas where plants, animals, and other organisms live and find adequate amounts of food, water, shelter, and space needed to sustain, which is exactly what this ESA does. It's important to note that the most significant threat to the eastern hognose snake is habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, and people. This ESA is a recognized habitat, aquatic corridor, and vital feeding ground for the endangered Easter spine, eastern spiny soft-shelled turtle. The Parks Department has, has acknowledged that, the spiny soft -shell, that it is a spiny soft-shell corridor and stated that they nest across the river from the proposed nature trail and lookout. According to the Endangered Species Act, human recreation is identified as a huge negative factor in blocking access to nesting, feeding, hibernation, and basking sites for the extremely shy spiny soft-shelled turtle. So putting a lookout in a pathway in an endangered species habitat should not be considered. Freshwater mussels are the most endangered organisms in North America. Nine freshwater mussel species were picked up along the shore in this ESA. One is considered extremely rare and endangered. Two are considered very rare, and four are considered rare. Easy public access and parking would provide an area to put kayaks and canoes into the water, damaging this endangered shor shoreline habitat. This tiny ESA is the nesting site for snapping turtles, which are listed as special concern by the Endangered Species Act, and is home to many other species, including river otter and wild mink, who have a specific habitat component of limited human contact, critical to their survival. To realize how small this ESA is and how intrusive it would be, it's 800 meters from the gate entrance to the large storm sewer outlet. The hill past the storm sewer is too steep and too wet to walk and leads to private property. The distance along the river from the proposed lookout to Halls Mill Road is a four-minute stroll. The wheelchair accessible loop 
takes three minutes to walk and is 200 meters, it would involve considerable site alterations. It takes two minutes to walk from the beginning of the trail at the top of the hill to the sewage pumping station. This hill is extremely steep, so the site plan calls for making a bench cut trail into the hill. This would involve considerable site alterations. To walk the loop from the berm to the lookout and the accessible trail back to the berm takes four minutes. To walk down the hill and around the two proposed trail loops takes approximately nine minutes. This is a nothing trail around a very smelly sewage pumping station, which will have an upgrade in 2023, which will triple its capacity. EPAC has made no recommendations for this proposed nature trail. The community feels this nature trail is also not needed due to the number of trails and parks and pathways in the immediate area. It is a four minute walk from the proposed Commissioner's Road access point and from Byron Northview Public School to the paved pathway leading directly into Springbank Park. Byron Northview does not endorse the Byron Valley Nature Trail. Participation House is one minute walk to the same pathway leading directly into Springbank Park, which has 30 kilometers of paved pathways. Warbler Woods is a four minute drive and has 3.9 kilometers of trails. Canes Wood is a seven minute drive and has 5.8 kilometers of trails and multi-use pathways. Sifton Bog is a six minute drive and has 2.7 kilometers of boardwalk. In closing, the community has voiced their complete opposition to the Byron Valley Nature Trail twice. This ESA is home to at least three endangered species and threatened species and must by law be protected and it's too small to accommodate pathways. The walking loop trail takes seven minutes and there are already wonderful accessible pathways and nature trails in the immediate area. The existing informal trails identified on the map are actually well used animal trails which demonstrates that this is an important <laughs> year round animal corridor and habitat. Please consider the concerns of the community and halt the plans for this tiny ESA. And thank you for allowing us to speak today. I also have 15 letters from people who were not able to attend today. And I have uh, a petition with 116 names on it of people that want this ESA left alone and protected. Okay. Thank you, we thank can you. submit those to the clerk. Thank Appreciate you. It. Uh, we also uh, just granted uh, delegation status to, I believe, uh, Participation House. Is that correct? And come on up. The uh, mic is yours. Just need an introduction, and you have the floor. So, just one second there. There's a button that'll turn okay. on your microphone. There we go. You're welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Stacy Sutton. I work for Participation House Services. Um, just a small thing to point out: um, when we're speaking of Participation House, we're the agency that provides support for David and other people to live. But we wouldn't necessarily say that Participation House is that exact site. So there are 50 homes within the City of London, which we provide support to, and everybody lives in their own home and has a, a space in that home. So it's important to understand the difference. Um, I work for uh, David Sutherland, who's here today, and I'll be speaking for him because he doesn't use words as a formal means of communication. David and I are here to support Byron Valley Nature Trail. To share a bit about David, he's a 51-year-old man who lives with a disability, which has a very rare connective tissue disease where joints can become permanently frozen and fibrous tissue can turn to bone for no reason. 
David is, David is the oldest man in the world living with this disability. David has many roles in his life that have helped him encourage others to see him in a different way. For example, David is a brother, uncle, brother-in-law, a gardener, a gamer, he loves virtual reality, a moviegoer, a naturalist, and now today is an activist on community issues. I tell you all of this to help you understand why this project is so important for all who live in the immediate community of the Byron Valley Nature Trail. David was projected to have a short life, yet here we are today proving the exact opposite of that, with a very, very full and meaningful life. If David stopped at the fact that his mobility issues wouldn't allow him to do things, he could have lived in isolation. Having a trail that is fully accessible for David and others such as mothers in the area for using a stroller or persons who may have alternative means of mobility will not only benefit these folks, but others too who have full mobility. Together, all people's lives will be richer and the purpose when people come to enjoy at the purpose of people coming to enjoy the outdoors together. This trail offers all nature lovers a place to react, re, or sorry, relax, interact, and connect and exercise together, creating a strong sense of community. In conclusion, David stands in support for the accessible trail for all, but more importantly, a trail that will bring community close together um, with people who would not normally have the opportunity to connect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutherland and Ms. Sutton. Okay, with that, I will turn to the committee uh, for any questions or comments. Councillor Hopkins. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for to staff for the presentation and the community as well as Participation House. And I'm just going to go forward with uh, making a few comments here on how I being part of this process. So this easement to allow for a trail access came about with an application for a development on Commissioner's Road. And at that time, we had asked that a plan for the trail be presented to a community meeting to be held somewhere in Byron. And that ended up happening in March. And at that time, there was a lot of confusion and frustration going on in the community because the understanding to some extent was this trail could be whatever you want it to be. It could end at the easement, it could end at the bottom of the hill, it could go towards the water's edge. And we, a community meeting was held in March and I wanna thank staff uh, because uh, after the walkabout, they did take into consideration some of the comments that were mentioned in that walkabout and, and have made cha changes. And part of the confusion, I think, came from the plan that was presented in March was that this is the plan. And it was a draft plan and changes have been made. And I appreciate that. And, and thank you to staff for that. I'm also glad to hear that the ESA will be managed in 2019. I'm hoping that will, will happen because it is important that our environmentally sensitive areas are managed by Upper Thames. The concerns I've heard from day one uh, is where is this trail going to? It's going nowhere. What's the bigger picture? The environmental concerns, I think, have been evident, especially in the presentation from the community, is how important protecting the environment is. And the other part, and I'm really glad that we are here this evening, is that the community felt that they were not being heard, and this is an opportunity that we listen. And for me, it's how do we fix it? So environment is important, protecting it. Accessibility, having people enjoy nature is important. I don't think those two should be pitted against one another. They're both very important. I think 
we have to step back a little bit and maybe not rush into this trail. And, and the reasons I'm asking that we may consider referring this back is because we heard tonight about the dike. We know all our city dikes are under review at the moment. This will be one of them, and what will be the plans for this dike? I have no idea, but I think that should be taken into consideration. The upgrades to the pumping station it sits right in the valley there. We've already undertaken um, uh, a lot of work from Halls Mills going to the Colonel Talbot pumping station in Lambeth because of all the developments going on. And we know that more work will happen. So those are important factors in determining how this trail will, will shape up and come about, about. The other part I'm concerned about is the uh, presentation on species at risk, endangered species. And I know we received a report from um, Upper Thames. Well, we didn't receive a, a report. We received comments from Upper Thames and MNR that they were consulted. But I think it is important that we receive or re get some comments from these two organizations on what was presented here this evening. So I, um, I'm looking at referring this back. Those two main reasons, not having a good understanding with the projects that are slated, uh, to understand those a little bit better, and to see if we can get some updated comments from Upper Thames and, and the MNR. And finally, I think it is important that this, whatever this trail, this final plan will look like, be presented again back to the community because it is important. Um, it's a very precious uh, jewel almost that is um, in the community. And you can see here tonight how it is um, um, very important to the community. Thank you, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, we have a, a motion for referral. Let's um, look for a seconder or, or further discussion. Councillor Cassidy, question? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to staff. So this is the staff recommendation before us is to receive this report for information. Well, through you to staff, what are the next steps if uh, Council goes ahead with the staff recommendation to receive the report? Um, <clears throat> through the chair, um, based on the comments tonight and the direction from uh, committee and council, um, it would be the same that we presented at, at uh, the community meeting, I believe, that we would uh, provide the updated trail plan, if that's as the plan shows tonight or some modifications that the, the uh, committee would like. Um, we would typically notify those who participated in the process to date, saying that the plan has been modified. Uh, we'd likely send a notice out to the same people who got the first uh, notice the first time and say the plan has been modified and refer them to our website to see the final plan, give people three or four weeks to provide comments on that, uh, and if necessary, make some other minor changes to it, and then um, set the process in place to uh, work on implementation and uh, engage the Conservation Authority uh, to manage the lands after the plan has been implemented. Thank you. Um, so just to be clear, let's say we just accept and receive as is without modifying at all. Then what are, what, how does staff proceed next? So there's nothing necessarily to update, but would there be further study done? Is there any further um, engagement? Is there any, these are the proposed trails. Will these be the ones as is, or could there be something that you discover down the road to, to cause you to modify the trails or the, the plan as is? And through the chair, um, we think the plan we've put in front of you address the, the major comments that were made by the public. Um, through Ms. McDougall and our consultants, we believe we've addressed all of the sensitive issues. Again, we're, we're using uh, primarily existing trails and upgrading those trails, making some minor changes to them. Uh, where we're proposing inclusive trails, 
Those are on uh, areas of infrastructure, the dike or areas where there's existing sewers. Uh, we are pulling trails back from the river's edge in order to pe keep people away from the river's edge. So uh, all of this is in, in, in line with uh, the work that was done at the coves, which was very successful. Um, the next steps technically would be uh, this work requires a permit from the Conservation Authority under their regulations. So we would have to de do a, a more detailed plan for them. They would like to know exactly how the trail will get up and down off the dike. Um, there's areas of debris there, concrete rubble and debris that we'd like to clean up. Um, we think through those processes for trail enhancements uh, and ecological restorations, we could get that permit through them. Um, but I think uh, key to that process is wrapping up the community engagement piece so that people understand how the trail's been changed. And there's been some major changes to it as far as uh, the length of accessible trails. Um, and what we understood after the public uh, walk was that we had uh, addressed most of the comments and concerns from folks there. So um, we think we're in, in a presenting a plan that's uh, reasonable and, and in line with our guidelines and our use of ESAs. And the Conservation Authority, when we engage them to manage ESAs, they do need a, a, a trail management plan to work from. Um, they, they find it very difficult to enter a site that hasn't had a trail plan done where we're closing inappropriate trails, placing trails where they should be. That provides access to do the uh, environmental works that would come, come along with this as well. So we're uh, a, a bit in limbo with the role of the Conservation Authority managing the lands if we don't have a trail plan and a restoration plan to implement. Further questions, comments? Um, if I might, uh, there are two, two items that were identified uh, as uh, major works that might be occurring within the area, uh, one being the, uh, uh, the pumping station uh, upgrading and the second being the, uh, the review of the, the dikes and uh, the One River EA. Um, how do those uh, interact or affect uh, the trail plan? Sure, to the chair. Um, Ms. McDougall can maybe remind me of the date of the dike uh, works. They are doing reviews of, of all the dikes in the city of London. Uh, this one's well down the list. I understood it was a good five years away, but that's just a review of the need and necessity for the dike, uh, perhaps uh, changing it in some way. Um, we don't know the answer to that at the moment. Uh, but we are proposing a fairly low-key upgrade here, a, a gravel trail on top of it. Um, the pumping station itself, I understood all works would be uh, contained to with inside the fence line. So if there are upgrades, it would be inside the fence. Now they're going to, of course, have a staging area, um, perhaps interrupt part of the trail use, uh, but that's several years away as, as well. So uh, they are factors to consider. Um, we don't, uh, I don't think that the, the trail upgrades that we're proposing would be a, a, a loss through any of those uh, major works. And, um, but we leave that for a discussion for the committee as far as the appropriateness to proceed at this time. We have a request for a referral from Councillor Hopkins, uh, but I haven't seen a seconder yet for that. So what we do have uh, as well, and the alternative is the uh, the staff recommendation. That's uh, moved by Councillor Cassidy. Uh, Councillor Van Holst, did you have a question? Uh, thank you very much. I'm, if I can, through you, I'd like staff to to comment on the the closeness of other accessible trails that was brought up by the by the residents. Um, okay. Uh, question for with respect to the the other accessible trails. Just uh, with respect to its, sorry. It's certainly, um, I believe the presentation from the community was fairly accurate with accessible uh, pathways being very, uh, fairly convenient in Springbank Park. Um, they're fairly close to this community and accessed uh, underneath Bowler Road fairly conveniently. Um, that said, I think the distinction is that, that, that those are park pathways, not necessarily nature trails. 
there is a distinction between the two areas, uh, and, and ESAs are generally used in a different way than a, than a park pathway. Uh, lots of accessible pathways. This would be a slightly different thing that, that brings you to the river's edge, and it's a different experience to be on a narrow gravel pathway than a multi-use pathway through Springbank Park. So they are fairly convenient. Mr. Fleming. Mr. Chair, uh, if you're to look at, uh, of course, the London plan and the way that we do our trail planning, we're intending to develop a system and um, multiple layers of different opportunities for um, recreation and, and um, the trails are definitely a part of that. Some of the distances that were referenced relate to automil automobile uh, travel times. And I think it's important to understand that within those different layers of opportunities for trails and, and pathways, as pointed out by Mr. McPherson, some are those that you would travel to by car. But the intention is, wherever possible, to also provide opportunities for people to walk to those type of trail systems. And particularly where there's opportunity for people that uh, don't want to travel uh, long distances. Uh, we talked about the age-friendly um, strategy as, as one of those elements, but also uh, the accessibility considerations that have been brought to bear. So we think that when building a city, uh, the idea is to provide trail opportunities of multiple different types and uh, those that are accessible close to home and um, also those that might be more regional in nature or citywide in nature that people might travel to by car. Thank you, Mr. Fleming. Uh, well, thank you very much. That's that's a good answer. For how many people is this close to home? Um, would we say? Sure, through the chair. Um, the reason this is timely is that right now uh, Byron is going through a little bit of an intensification program, and the reason we were able to acquire these lands is because there was a new apartment be building being proposed. Um, Currently, this, this fairly isolated area is, is not accessible very well to Commissioner's Road. And uh, with the new access way, it does open the door for, for people to hike in the natural area next to the river's edge, coming off of Commissioner's Road, doing a small loop. And even if it is only you know, a 15-minute walk, uh, certainly that gets people out into nature. And, and I think we believe if, if people do get into nature, they learn to value it and appreciate it uh, and learn to look after it better and, and, and protect them better. Um, thank you. And um, do we have any sense of the, the cost uh, for th this work or the maintenance annually? Sure, certainly through the chair. Good question. Um, Ms. McDougall's put together a, a cost estimate for the works, including all the things that we dealt with on site with the neighbors, including perhaps looking at upgrading some fencing along the, the new access way, which is technically outside of the ESA, but we said we would look at that with them. So uh, we're in the uh, area of eighty to $90,000 to do the trail upgrades from, from one end to the other for accessibility, the lookouts, fence upgrades, etc. Uh, once that's complete, um, we do turn this uh, location over to the Conservation Authority to manage it. It's built into their management program, but it, it, uh, there is an additional cost of that, about $700 a hectare per year. So not a, not a huge cost for natural areas to, to manage them. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we're at the point of uh, trying to move forward. We had uh, a motion... Uh, did not find a seconder. Uh, we have a motion that has come forward. We still haven't found a seconder for that. Uh, Councillor Cassidy moved the staff recommendation. Is there a seconder for that? Okay, Councillor Helmer. Any further discussion at this time? Councillor Helmer. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say a few things. I uh, want to thank the two delegations. I know that the uh, first delegation is representing a lot of people who are opposed to the idea of having trails. Uh, in this area, and I want to recognize that uh, the second delegation for participation house, you know, w was in support. And um, <clears throat> we, this reminds me, of course, of our not that long ago discussion about the Medway Valley and uh, what we should do with trails there. And uh, somewhat, I don't want to repeat uh, all of the discussion that we had at uh, that time. Uh, I want to keep focused on a couple of things. Uh, one is, I do not agree with the idea that uh, just leaving things the way they are is the best way to manage an environmentally significant area. We know 
uh, from research that you actually have to actively manage some of these things if you want to prevent harms happening to the natural environment. There's different ways of doing that. Um, the informal trails that get established can be really problematic uh, for habitat uh, and for species that are in the area. That's why we come up with policies around how we're going to plan trails in environmentally significant areas. That's why we do things like three season inventories of species. That's why we have staff who are ecologists and we have people at the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority who specialize in species at risk. Right? We've had Mr. Gillingwater here talking to us about spiny top-shelled turtles. They are involved in this process to look at these pieces because we are concerned about what could happen to species uh, that are at risk, both animals and uh, plants. And you know, we have a very good trail management process. Um, we seem to have trouble applying it. So we have great policy. Uh, we, we've um, had a whole process for engaging in the community about trails. And when it comes time to actually putting in a trail, um, a lot of times people say, I don't want this trail. And uh, you know, I listen very carefully to what people are saying. And I understand the concerns for uh, the environment. But you know, questions around, um, I don't really want to see people down here. Uh, I'd like to discourage people from going down here. I just like it left alone. What that means in practice is that uh, people who are able to use the, the area because they don't have mobility challenges, they keep using it. That's why those informal trails are there. They're not just caused by animals. They're caused by people who are enjoying this area. And it's kind of like a quasi-private area. It's not owned by them. Uh, it's paid for by somebody else. Um, it's going to be maintained uh, soon by the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority. Um, and it's got this kind of quasi-private character. It's really secluded. Not, not too many people come down there. But I think this is going to be public space. It needs to be public space. And um, you know, I think the changes that have been made from the trails advisory group actually walking the site are reasonable. You know, I personally would have preferred a bigger trail loop. Uh, that used more of the berm, I think that would have been fine. But they, they made an accommodation there where they changed it. Uh, so it's not as, it's not as significant. Um, and then, you know, I find it difficult to then say, well, it's so small, you should just not bother. You know, so it's too big, but now it's too small, and just, just don't do anything. And there's a lot of arguments about why we shouldn't do anything. Uh, I do not find those arguments persuasive, which is why I'm supporting the staff recommendation. I think a reasonable trail system down here, some level one trails, is very appropriate. Some level two trails, very appropriate. You know, people when they're living in the city, they need to have this kind of quality of life amenity around them. That's what makes living in the city so great. Uh, yes, Spring Bank Park is there and it's awesome. I've been on this little stub of trail that leads into this huge trail network. Uh, but people need different things uh, in the community and they need them where they live uh, and not necessarily have to travel across town to go find something good. So uh, I, I support the trail systems there. I understand why people are concerned I think sometimes people imagine the worst possible scenario, right? All the species will be destroyed. People will come in and wreck the neighborhood. That doesn't happen. You know, the coves, we put in a good trail system. The coves is great. No big problems. So I, I know that there's some fear about change uh, and that it will be bad. But we have a lot of really good policy in there to protect the species at risk. Uh, I think if we do a good trail system, the overall the area is going to be better, especially in the near term uh, and in the longer term as people start to you know, choose to live in this area because there's a nice trail system there and that's something that they're looking for. Um, and I, so I think we have to proceed with this. I think the money is well spent on something like this. I support the staff recommendation. I want to thank everybody who participated, whether you like the idea of trails going in or not, because we're not going to agree on everything all the time. Uh, I think that this is a good idea. Councillor Hopkins. Uh, thank you. And uh, just before I make my comments, and I can see I've... Um, this motion to receive most likely will will pass. I, I wonder if I could, I'd like to make a friendly amen, amendment as in the original motion that the uh, final uh, plan uh, go to the community meeting to be held in Byron and all interested parties be notified of the community meeting. It's a friendly amendment. I'd look to the mover and the seconders at huh? Councillor Helm. I'm, I'm fine with that. I think the staff had described that they were going to put the information up online and people could access it there. I think if there's going to be a meeting in the community, that's just a better way of, 
of answering people's questions and giving them information about what's being proposed. There's pretty substantial changes from what people saw before, so I think that's reasonable. Councillor Cassidy is the mover. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to go to staff and see uh, what their thoughts are on, on holding another community meeting. Mr. McPherson. Uh, Mr. Chair, we're glad to do that if uh, that's what the committee desires and certainly always want to um, ensure that the public's included in our processes and uh, also fully aware of the plans that are being set. Councillor Kessler. So, so through, uh, uh, can I make my comments now or is Councillor Hopkins, uh, okay. Okay, so uh, I have no problem with that amendment. Uh, we heard from our ecologist who I respect immensely, um, that uh, staff have heard uh, from a, a, a number of people in the community that do support the trails. Uh, what tends to happen in these kinds of engagements is we often hear from people opposed. Uh, so my concern, having heard of the, the community's response to past engagements on this issue, my, my, my fear is um, opposition will come out on force, in force, and people in favor uh, do so more quietly. And so I do not want to raise expectations that, um, and, and I just hope the councillor is aware and lets her constituents know that with community engagement, uh, and with, with a large force uh, opposed to changes or, or plans, um, that, that, that what they want to see happen may not necessarily happen. I just don't want to raise expectations, but I certainly um, am in favor of community engagement, and I just, I just want to put that out there. Um, so I have some comments. Councillor Helmer brought up uh, comparison very briefly to the Medway Valley, and, and I also see the comparison. What I see also here in this instance is um, much lower impact trails compared to what was proposed in the Medway Valley, as low impact as possible, chips and dust and, and, and wood chips. Um, I also, Councillor Helmer also brought up comparison to the coves, and I see the coves and what happened there as a real success story. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that the that staff brought the advisory committee members to the coves to see what was accomplished there. And if you speak to uh, Mr. McClenaghan and, and, and the people who for 20 years have really advocated strongly for something to be done in the coves, uh, they are very supportive whenever things like this come up of what staff generally is proposing because they see what happened in the coves, the turnaround that took place there. And so what did happen there? There were um, unmanaged trails and rogue trails going through invasive species, going through very sensitive areas. And those kinds of uh, rogue trails were closed. And the, the use of those trails was actively discouraged. Because what happens when, when you have managed trails, people tend to use that. It's, that. it's that using the path of least resistance, right? So people would rather use a trail with wood chips rather than go off-road and into who knows what's in, in the areas where it's not a managed trail. There could be poison ivy and things like that in there. So the active management of trails encourages people to use those trails and stay away from the more sensitive areas. What else happened in the coves? It was a, it was a dumping ground. People were dumping large items in there like, um, like car tires and things like that. That kind of abuse of, of a beautiful area was put to an end. People were littering in there. That kind of abuse ended. Um, and again, that active management of trails led to people staying on the path, staying on the path where we want them to stay and away from the areas we don't want them to use. Um, I would say that keeping it as is and pretending nothing, nothing really bad is happening there and we can preserve this site and, and protect it 
by by not managing it, it really is 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 counterintuitive. And it's not simply people that don't have mobility issues that are currently using th this this uh, environmentally significant area. It's also people that are doing the bad things because they're doing it without scrutiny. They're in there and they're they're hidden. And so it allows for those party pits and drug use and the littering and all of that thing, all of those things to take place because there isn't any kind of active management taking place. The best path for protecting this area is management of this area. I do believe that. We have a, an ecologist on staff for a reason because Ms. McDougall has the expertise, the education, the wisdom, the experience, and I defer to her and her knowledge. And when she is providing us with, with her insight and her recommendations, I'm, I'm thankful and grateful for that. And as an ecologist, her calling is, the, is ecology and the environment. She is certainly not going to recommend to us something that's going to harm the natural environment here in London, which is, which is one of our, our major assets in the city, the protection of these areas. And, and, and so that is why I, I moved the staff recommendation and I am grateful for the community to come out. I understand their fears and their worries, but when I look at what has happened in the coves and all they have to do is look 20 years ago at photographs of what the coves looked like and what it looks like there today, the, the, the difference is night and day. Councilor Hopkins. Uh, thank you. And um, I'm glad to see C in there that a community meeting will be held in Byron with the final plan. But I respectfully disagree with my colleagues. I think there's a problem with our trail process here. And I know staff have done a lot of work, but I'm starting to wonder what community engagement really means. We're not the experts. We can speak about the coves, we could talk about other areas, but I do think that when we allow trails in environmentally sensitive areas, that we get reports and an understanding what we are doing with these trails, and we have no idea. Community engagement, the community understands their area, for sure you, we don't always agree on things, but the community has a right to be heard and to be engaged. We are not the experts. Here at the committee, we are making a decision for this community. I'm the counselor of that ward. I wouldn't want to put myself in that position. I don't think it's up to us to fix it. There's a problem with our process. And I am very... Um, uh, I don't know what the word is. I'm just very concerned about how we sit here and talk about community engagement and what that means. I'm starting to wonder. So I uh, am disappointed that the referral was not uh, supported. I think uh, that we are providing where this plan to go ahead, not even understanding what the plans for this area are going to look like is something that I cannot support. So uh, I thank you for at least putting in the fact that this plan will go to the community for them to finally see that, how it's going to look. Councillor Van Holst. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I certainly won't accuse your committee of lacking creative attention. Um, my question uh, through uh, you to staff or, or, the, or to the councillor, I suppose, is um, we see that the new plan had some mitigating um, uh, changes in that. Were there any mitigations that, that weren't included in this plan that were suggested? Uh, 
chair. Through the chair. I, I believe from the site walk that we did, we, we listened to all the suggestions that were put forward and, and included all of them in the revised plan. Uh, if there's something we've missed, uh, we're prepared to certainly receive that now. Uh, we did circulate the plan to everybody who participated and haven't heard that we did miss anybody anything, but if, if we did, uh, we're happy to take a look at that. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? We have a motion. It's been amended and seconded, uh, discussed. So at this point, I'll call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries three to one. Thank you very much, and thank you for everyone coming out tonight and for your presentations as well. Uh, moving on to item number 4.1, items for direction, is the 10th report of the London Advisory Committee on Heritage. And I would uh, take a motion to accept the recommendations. Moved by Councillor Helmer and seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Any discussion on this item? Seeing none, we'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. In item 4.2, we have a report from Ms. O'Hagan uh, with respect to uh, Section 37 Planning Act bonusing uh, revisions, uh, which is timely and associated with 2.1. Uh, did Ms. O'Hagan have a presentation, or is it just an item for direction? Um, Mr. Chair, no, I don't have a formal presentation. I'm happy to answer any specific questions or give you a brief overview of what is in the report. I believe the committee's uh, read the report. Uh, if anybody wishes more information, any questions? Councilor Helmer. I just want to say this one, uh, similar to the one we had in, in consent, where we're moving forward on uh, sort of integrating affordable housing and trying to figure out how we're going to deal with all those different things. I think also dealing with this specific issue around bonusing and what, what, what's our strategy around that? What are we going to prioritize? What are the sort of key things we're trying to achieve? Uh, that's very timely. I think we're starting to, we're moving into a new era of bonusing provisions uh, potentially here in the city of London. So I think it's really smart to get started on this now uh, with all the development activity. People are interested in building in London record kind of construction activity. Uh, the sooner we get this sorted out and then clarify expectations for everybody, I think uh, the, the better it will be. Mr. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I want to make clear that uh, we will have a, an open engagement process on this, but we'll also be working closely with the development industry um, through this next step of the process. Um, the part of this is about how can we create a more transparent, repeatable, predictable uh, kind of um, bonusing process and certainly we'll be speaking to them to understand uh, what that looks like from their perspective. Thank you. Um, from this one, uh, I think probably one of the really important pieces is uh, is starting to quantify uh, uplift associated with the bonusing because that gives us a sense of, uh, of what we would, might seek uh, in exchange for bonusing and, and uh, uh, and those um, those provisions. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this one as well. And I would echo Councillor Helmer's comments. Any further uh, questions or comments? Yeah, seeing none, I would take a motion to uh, receive the report. Actually, I think it's a bit further than that. Uh, my apologies uh, to receive and uh, direct uh, civic administration to research and review press practices. Moved by Councillor Cassidy, second by Councillor Helmer. Any further questions or discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Any deferred matters or additional business? Seeing none, I'll take a, oh, sorry, uh, I'll take a motion to move into a confidential session and uh, the reasons for which uh, we can read out. It 
A personal matter pertaining to identifiable individuals, including municipal employees, with respect to the 2019 Mayor's New Year's Honors List. I'll take a motion to move into session, a confidential session, moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Helmer, and we'll call the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries four to zero. Okay, uh, it sounds like we'll convene uh, in camera in this, in this room. Um, so, uh, and then we'll uh, report out from there once uh, done. Uh, it should not be long.